It's immediately after the close of our last episode. As in Judge Selby's courtroom, Prosecutor Frederick Apt triumphantly watches Lillian Morrison leave the witness stand. As the prosecutor sends for his next witness, Perry Mason rises from his chair at the defense table, walks down the aisle, through the door, and into the corridor. Okay, wise guy. Okay, you got a bet. Five bucks. And my five says he wins. Uh, <clears throat> Paul. Huh? Oh, oh. Uh, see you, Cliff. Uh, yeah, Perry. Friend of yours? Friend. That vulture? I suppose you want a piece of the bet. Sorry you made it? No, I just offering. Okay, I'll cut your loss. I'll take two fifty. Now, Perry, I didn't mean I would... Let me do the worrying. Well, I ought to do a little worrying, too. I've got two bucks and a half at stake. You want me to take it all? No, I guess I can stand it. Oh, that's what I like about the people who work with me. They have so much faith. Yeah, I've never seen you up the creek without a paddle before. (laughs) Don't you think it's interesting? Very interesting. Now, that app is making it look as if May Grant was carrying a torch for Marcel Blanc. Yes. Uh, Me with no paddle. Mm. Uh, Paul... Hmm? Remember a Mrs. Morgan, the woman your man thought was Kitty? Morgan? Morgan. Oh, sure. Mm-hmm. Well, I just talked to her. She's a very nice person. Uh, she'll cooperate. How? Well, look. If Kitty DiCarlo has an alibi for the time of the murder, it's a false alibi. Uh-huh. Now, I can break a false alibi if I get enough information. Mm-hmm. So, I want the information. Now, you get Mrs. Morgan, Paul. Get Mrs. Morgan... I do. Uh, just uh, get into the witness stand, please. Yes, sir. This chair squeaks. Uh, tell us your name, please. Haven't you got someone who... Never mind the squeak, Mrs. Dean. Just uh, tell us your name and address. Dean. Carolyn E. Dean. 4739 Platt Street, Chicago, Illinois. And your occupation? Just a little furniture oil. Sit as still as you can, Mrs. Dean, if it bothers you. Now, uh, your your occupation. Chambermaid. Michigan Clark Hotel. That's in Chicago? Yes, sir. I've been there 12 years. I see. And uh, you were on duty the morning of August 18th? I was. Oh. On, on what floor of the uh, hotel, please? The sixth floor. Now, Mrs. Dean, I ask you if you see anyone in this courtroom, anyone whom you also saw on the sixth floor on that morning in question. I do. Um, two people. Uh, Point them out, please. Well, um, that lady over there. Oh, uh, stand up, Mr. Carlo. You saw this lady, Mr. Carlo. Hmm? Her and a little girl. Uh, Just a moment. Uh, uh, Do you see anyone else? Um, yes, sir. That one. Uh, Stand up, Mr. Grant. You also saw this woman, the defendant, Mrs. Grant? Yes, sir. Sit down, Mr. Carlo and Mrs. Grant. Uh, I'm going to show you two photographs, Mrs. Dean. Uh, give me the last one. I, um, I show you these photographs. One of the murdered man, Marcel Blanc. Oh, I saw him that morning, too. And this photograph, the child known as Dory Grant. Uh, yes, sir. I-, I saw her, too. Good. Very good, indeed. Uh, you may tell the jury what you saw happen that morning, Mrs. Dean. Yes, sir. Well, the first thing we do in the morning is check with the front of the house. The front of the house? The manager's office. We learn who checked out early so we can get the rooms ready. That morning they uh, told me 611 and, and 613 were checking out early. I see. So I, I went to clean up 611 at the double uh, to clean it up first. I was pushing my service card down the hall when I saw the lady. Oh, uh, which one? Uh, that one there, um, Mr. Carlo. Her and the little girl. Now, you couldn't be mistaken. No, sir. They passed right by me. The little girl asked what I was pushing. <laughs> she was a sweet little thing. Uh, did the child seem unhappy? Uh, was, was she crying? Or... Oh, no, no. She was okay. Uh, uh, continue, please. Well, I went down to 611. I took out my ring keys to open the door. And then I saw it was already open. Not wide, just a little. Um, well, maybe a foot. Well, I was going on inside... But I heard them talking. Them? Mm, that one over there, uh, Mrs. Grant. Uh, and the man in the picture, Mr. Blank. At first, I just heard her voice. Uh, could you understand what she was saying? Not till I got close to the door. I could see them in the mirror over the dresser. He was standing by the window, uh, smoking a cigarette, and, well, kind of, well, kind of watching. Uh, Mrs. Grant? She was um, right in front of him. Was she uh, 
uh, fully dressed. Uh-huh. Uh. Well, um, uh, go on. What was, uh, what was she saying? She was asking him something. Just asking? Not just asking. Begging. Yeah, begging him to let her go with him. Now, be very, very careful, Mrs. Dean. Repeat only what you heard. That's what I heard. She was begging to go with him. You're certain he didn't ask her? No, sir, I'm positive. He wasn't saying much at all. He's just smoking that cigarette and watching her. Yeah, and she? Well, um, she said something like, Well, I'll do whatever you want. Whatever you tell me, only don't leave me. Please don't leave me. I'll come on my hands and knees if I have to. And now, once again, once again, and, and think carefully. She begged to go with him. Yes, sir. She even started to cry. That's all. Your witness, Mr. Mason. <laughs> Mrs. Dean. Yes, sir? Now, you're a good housekeeper. It's my job. That's why that squeaky chair bothers you. You, you hate to see a job half finished. Well, yes, sir. So do I. I hate unfinished jobs and half truths. Now, uh, don't get nervous. And think a moment. You say Mrs. Grant asked to go with Marcel Blanc? Yes, sir, she did. And just before that, you saw the child being led away from her room? Why, yes, sir. Now, did any single thing you heard, did anything indicate that Mrs. Grant wanted to go with Blanc because she was, uh, well, in love with him? Well, uh, I... Yes or no, please? Well, no, sir. If all the truth were known, couldn't she have been begging to go with him to protect the little girl? Well, yes, sir, I... I guess so. She never said why she wanted to go. So, in truth, she could have hated that man, right? I, I guess she could have, if that was her reason. I, I mean, if she was worried about the child. She was awful worried, Mr. Mason. She was eating her heart out over something. Exactly. Eating her heart out with fear. Fear for the little girl whom she loved. Not Marcel Blanc. That's all. Thank you. Uh, just a moment, Mrs. Dean. Just a little moment. Yes, sir. When you heard Mrs. Grant alone with Marcel Blanc in that hotel room, did Mrs. Grant mention anyone else? No, sir. But... She begged to go with him, with a man we know was most charming and handsome and very attractive to women. Huh? Yes, sir. She didn't say anything about anybody else, not the kid or anybody. She just said she had to be with him. Had to be with him. She was thinking only of him. As, as far as we know. Yes, sir. Just him. And now we'll see who May Grant was thinking about when we call the next witness. You may step down, Mrs. Dean, and thank you. What do you think, Perry? Mm-hmm. Well, that tells me a lot. Mm-hmm. Doesn't look so good, hmm? Huh? You're worried? Well, aren't you? Oh, here I am. About lots of things. Oh, Perry. That uh, squeaky chair worries me. Hmm? Oh, you. Seriously, Perry? Seriously, Della. I'm also worried about Paul's bet of two dollars and a half. Oh. May Grant is looking worried. Perry Mason, you're the most exasperating man. You jumped from Paul's two fifty to May Grant. Same thing, Della. I've got to protect Paul's investment. Give me three sheets of white paper. What? Three sheets of white paper, a sharpened pencil, a straight edge ruler. Come on, come on, Della. This is very important. Paper, ruler, and a. No, no, now, no, Della. If the... I had the paper and the pencil and the ruler, why, then you'd know what I wanted to do. What? Come, on, come on, be a good secretary. Open my briefcase. But he knows better than anybody else how much cause there is for real worry now. Worry about more than Mr. Paul Drake's $2.50. But Perry also knows the importance of fighting worry with a smile. So with the light touch of those three sheets of white paper... But won't you join us tomorrow...
The strategy of Prosecutor Frederick Apt has been clear and simple and deadly to prove not only that May Grant killed Marcel Blanc, but also to prove that May was passionately in love with the murdered man and that out of her infatuation grew the motive for murder. <coughs> well, one look at May's white, drawn face, the way she clutches her husband's hand, would indicate how beautifully Apt is succeeding. And one look at defense lawyer Perry Mason, who is working rapidly on a paper spread before him, would indicate that he also is desperately worried. But if you could stand with Della and look over Perry's shoulder... Almost finished, Ellen. Yes, Perry. I'm ruling three sheets of paper here into columns. Yeah, two columns to a page. That's hmm? right. One page for you, one page for me, and one for May. All right. But why? Uh, just a second, just a second. Ah, left. Now, I have noticed something. Mm -hmm. The witness chair squeaks. What did you say? The witness chair squeaks. You know what that means. You get a chance to get even. Perry Mason, you won 90 cents from me at the McKean trial, and I'm well, not... now is your chance to get even. I absolutely refuse What's to have... What's the matter? It... Are you, uh... Scared. No, I'm not scared, but I oh, know... Oh, now the chair has got a lovely squeak. And I thought you were serious. I am. As a matter of fact, it has two squeaks. A single squeak and a double squeak. <laughs> oh. Now, you take one of these sheets of paper and I'll take one. Uh, oh, do you want the doubles or the singles? The squeaks, that is. Um, which one do you want? Well, I'd kind of like the doubles. No, 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 no. I want the doubles. Oh, well, since you were loser last time. All right, now, we'll both keep track for how much? Oh, uh, a dime a squeak. That's best. Mm -hmm. Shake. Right. Right. Wait a minute. What about the third sheet of paper? May gets that. Oh. Look at her, Dellen. <sighs> yes, I see. She just looks... Bad, yes. Now, let us take her mind off Mr. Apt and his evidence. She can be umpire, keep score, and settle any disputes. Okay. You know why she looks especially down today, don't you, Chief? Hmm? Today is Dory's birthday. Today? Yeah. Oh. Well, a more reason. She keeps on looking whipped, she'll be whipped. That's right. Uh, take this page to her, hmm? Huh? And make sure she's got a pencil. And don't try to get around her. I want a fair and impartial referee. Uh, tell us your name and address, please. Pratt. Frederick Pratt, Chicago, Illinois. And your occupation, Mr. Pratt? I manage a restaurant near the Chicago Air Terminal. Now, uh, Mr. Pratt, uh, what you're about to tell us is the thing you saw yourself. Uh, simple, but important. What? That... Eh? This chair squeaks. Oh, well, never mind that now. Yes, but don't you think... Uh, that... Mr. Pratt. Yes, sir. Have you ever seen the defendant before? I saw her. She came into the restaurant the night of the 17th. Now, tell us just what you saw. Well, this fellow Blank and Mr. Carlo and the kid were all in booth number 12. That's a back booth. You knew them? No, but when you showed me their pictures, I remembered. Very well. Go on. It was after midnight. That's our rush time. I was busy and didn't notice anybody in the booth. Well, not at first. Except that a man and a woman and a kid were in it. And then what happened? Well, all of a sudden, a woman let out a yell. I looked over, and I saw this Mrs. Grant. Uh, where was she? Standing in front of the booth. She hollered something like, uh, there you are, or I found you. I don't remember the exact words, but... Oh, uh, what did you do? Well, I thought something was wrong, so I headed over to stop it. You know, if there was going to be a disturbance. Well, then I felt kind of foolish. No? She didn't need any help. She was doing okay. Well, what do you mean? Well, the time I got over there, Mrs. Grant and this guy Blank, they were... Hugging and kissing and... Oh. Yeah, yeah, they were in a big clinch. Oh. Well, I'd gone charging over there like Galahad to the rescue, so I had to say something. Yes, of course. And she had yelled out. Mm. So, after a while, when they uh, came up for air... <laughs> well, uh, go on, go on. Well, I said, uh, anything the matter, lady? Which was a foolish question, because anybody could see there was nothing the matter. And, uh... And uh, what did Mrs. Grant say? She didn't make any complaint. No? Uh, seems they got separated in the terminal, and Auntie May, they called her Auntie May, was so happy to see the guy... Uh, she kissed him? Just a moment. That's a leading question. I'll rephrase it then, Mr. Mason. Uh, they were kissing. It looked, uh, 
mutual to me. And let me ask, did Mrs. Grant uh, seem afraid, frightened? Oh, oh, everything was fine and dandy. And the little girl, was she all right? Oh, sure. She was drinking a glass of hot milk. Yeah, everything was hunky-dory, Mr. Rapp. Love and kisses. Now, now that's all, Mr. Pratt. Are you a witness, Mason? Uh, no questions. What? No questions, Mr. App. Oh. Well, since it's getting late, Your Honor, I move we recess until tomorrow morning. Hmm? Well, have you any objections, Mr. Mason? Oh, no, no, no objections. <coughs> so ordered. Court recessed until 10 o'clock tomorrow morning. Perry now, Mason. now, Della. Eight single squeaks and 15 doubles. That's seven more doubles. Della, you can't count two of my singles now, and one of your doubles. Listen, you owe me 70 cents, Perry Mason, and don't you try to get out of it. All now, right, that's what all you... right, all right, all right, Della. Take our tally sheets to the referee. We will abide by May's decision. Uh, here comes Aunt. Tell May I'll see her later. You just wait. You'll see that I'm right. We will let the judge settle it for us. Oh. Huh? Why are you going to have the judge settle, Mr. Mason? Hmm? Oh. Oh, it's Mr. Rath. Well, so it is. <laughs> yeah. A little argument with your staff, Mason? Call it a dispute. Hmm? No, yeah, why did you... Uh, take those pages to the judge before Mr. Rath strains his eyes, Bella. We'll get our answers later. Yes, sir. Well, you're changing your strategy, Mason. I am? You didn't cross-examine Lillian Morrison. You only asked that chambermaid a question or two. You didn't cross-examine this last witness at all. We'll know the score this afternoon, Mr. Mason. Oh, fine. Yes, Mason, I've been watching you. Well, this man is on the alert, Della. Oh, right in there pitching all the time. He noticed that I didn't cross-examine Mr. Pratt. Oh? He wonders why. Oh. I think I'll tell him. Why, Chief? You're tipping your strategy. Well, I think he deserves it. Uh, come here a moment, Zapp. I'll show well, you why I didn't dare cross-examine Pratt. Now, if you'll just sit here in the witness chair, Zapp. Go on, go on. No. All right, nice. Now, um, notice this chair, if you please. Uh, what about it? It squeaks. And not only a single squeak, Mr. Zapp, but this is a deluxe chair. Single and double squeak. Mm. And do you know something, Mr. Rapp? Now, please listen carefully, because I am explaining my strategy. When you finished with Mr. Pratt, the chair had squeaked 15 double squeaks, but only eight singles. Really? And I had the singles. The street had the doubles. Well, you can see, Mr. Rapp. It was I was losing by 70 cents. Now, if I kept the witness in the chair, why, I might have gone on and on and on. Oh. I'm sure that you would have done the same thing had you been in my shoes. Dollars are hard to come by these days. Very amusing, Mr. Mason. I hope you'll keep on being amused. Oh, we'll try, Mr. Hatt. We'll try real hard. Ah, oh, lovely smile, Miss Street. Thank you. I wonder if you'll wear it long. Well? Especially if you knew my strategy. If you knew what I'm thinking about right now. Uh, good day, Mr. Mason. Good day. Goodbye. Goodbye. Perry. Um, there is a keen lad. Think he is going to pull a rabbit out of the hat? Mm. More likely an axe. Yes, but then why tell you? Well, Mr. Apt is gouging in the clinches. He wants me to worry. Oh? Yes, a keen lad. He got what he wanted. Um, are you worried? Yes, about more than 70 cents. And about more than Paul's two dollars and a half. No, no. Look, um, how about doing some birthday shopping for Dory, huh? You can use some of your winnings. And then how would you like to meet me in the conference room of the jail? I can tell you this. Perry Mason's hunch is right. There is reason to worry. Because Mr. Apt is about to spring a new bit of strategy. But more of that tomorrow, so won't you be sure and join us? It's early evening, some hours after the trial of State versus May Grant adjourned, 
as Perry Mason and Della drive towards the Grant home to help celebrate Dory's sixth birthday. We'll join Perry and Della in a few moments. But first, let's go to the apartment house on Baker Street, where Kitty DiCarlo has been living under the watchful eye of Anna B. Hurley. And let's join Mr. Frederick Apt, prosecutor, as in the corridor outside Kitty's apartment, he stops to admire himself in the hall mirror, shifts the package he carries to his other arm, removes his hat, makes certain his hair is combed smoothly, then... Hmm. Just a second. All right. Huh? Oh, Mr. Ab. Well... Good evening, my dear. I'm not disturbing you. Oh, no. I wasn't expecting company. Oh, you look very nice. Oh, you've seen these hostess pajamas before. Indeed I have. Indeed I have. Mm. Oh, please, come in. I, I was just surprised to see you. I forgot my manners. Oh, thanks. I'll take your coat. Thank you. And that package. Oh, no, I'll just put it here on the table. All right. Well, I'm glad you're alone, my dear. Mm-hmm. It's nice. I mean, being with you. Hmm, cozy. Hmm, very cozy. That's why I hate to... Oh, let's sit down, shall we? Mm. And, my dear, I think it's best if you sit beside me. On the couch, Mr. Abbott? Well, yes. I have some, um, well, some rather unpleasant news for you. No, it's nothing too important, but still disturbing. What news? Come sit down, huh? All right. There we are. Are you comfortable? Mm, very comfortable. And this is pleasant. Very, very pleasant. Mm-hmm. Now, what did... What Sometimes did you... I resent the affairs of the world. I really do. What? Well, those affairs intrude. Oh. But we have our duty. Mm-hmm. No matter how unpleasant our duty, we mustn't shirk it. What are you trying to tell me, Mr. Hatt? Yeah, that unpleasantness. Sorry, I have to tell you. This day of all days. This day? Oh, I know where your thoughts have been all this day, my dear. You do? On your little girl. What? <laughs> you didn't think I'd forget her birthday. I never forget a date, my dear. Oh, oh. I remember saying it on the record. I. Well, I've tried not to think of it. No. I try not to think of Dari at all. Ah, poor lady, poor lady. Oh, it's sweet of you to remember. I'm a most considerate man to some people, my dear. Mm. As you shall learn. For instance, you know what's in that package? No. Ice cream. Ice cream? Well, sure, but actually. And little cupcakes. How nice. Nah, I like cupcakes. I thought we might have a quiet celebration. Uh, that was thoughtful of you. No, but that isn't all. No? No, I brought an extra special treat. We can have the sherbet and cupcakes as sort of a party for your daughter. Then, a little later on, that is, if you aren't too tired, there's a bottle of sparkling burgundy in the package. Well. <laughs> I'm a most considerate man, my dear. You've behaved yourself beautifully. You deserve a celebration, too. Oh, you're a surprising guy, Mr. A uh, thoughtful man, Mr. Carlo. Does my idea of a pleasant evening please you? Oh, but just a second. Yes? What about that disturbing news? No, no hurry. I know, but... Just we'll make get... us some coffee first, hmm? Well... I'd like some coffee. Okay. Maybe I'd better put that other stuff on ice. No, it isn't necessary. Well, the room's warm. The ice cream is going to... I had it packed. Oh. Oh, yes. Dry ice. Oh. Now... Let's have some coffee. And then shall we talk? <laughs> oh, 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 this is the nicest birthday party I've ever had. Oh, we're uh, glad, honey. It's the nicest present. Oh, Mr. Mason, it's only... I know, Dory. Everything would be just perfect... If your mommy were here, hmm? Yes, that's it. Well, I, um, I have a little surprise for you, Dory. Oh? Why? Maybe I'd better help Bill with the coffee, hmm? Yeah, I'll just take our cup. What's the surprise, Mr. Mason? It's a record. 
a record that you can play on your phonograph. Do you want more coffee, Terry? Yes, please, Della. I'm uh, giving the record to Dory now. Yes, I'll be right back. Uh, where is your record player, Dory? Hmm? Over there. Music, Mr. Mason? Yeah, you wait and see. All right. Can I play it now? Yes, of course. It's yours. Can I put it on myself? Well, if you'll be extra, extra careful. I will. Oh, uh, just a second, Dory. Yes, Mr. Mason? You understand, don't you? I mean, you understand why your mommy can't be here with you. Well, I... Well, I know she can't. But you understand she is thinking of you and wishing she were here with you. I wish she were here, too, Mr. Mason. Mm. Well, maybe we can almost have her here. Like magic? Mm, something like magic. Now, you play the record, honey. Hello, darling. Mommy. Happy birthday, darling. Thank you, Mommy. It's Mommy. Mommy darling. wishes she could be with you, darling. But I know that Daddy and Mr. Mason have explained. Did, Mommy. And I know that you had the nicest party and the nicest present. Yes. And that you and Mr. Mason and Stella and Daddy had the best ice cream and cake. You didn't let Daddy eat too much, did you, darling? <laughs> <laughs> did you? You've got to take care of Daddy. I will, Mommy. And Daddy and Mr. Mason and Della, they'll take care of you. Yes. And, Dolly, I want you to know Mommy's thinking about you. That she loves you. I love you. Did you know that I was making some new clothing for Manuel Jr.? I have been so very busy I haven't finished, but you'll get them tomorrow or, or, or the next day. Here? No, I've got to say nighty-night, baby. And happy birthday. Let's sing it, hmm? Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Dolly. Happy birthday to you. Good night, darling. Oh. oh, Mommy. Are you going to see Mommy tonight, Mr. Mason? Well, yes, for a minute. We're going back to the... Uh, we're going where she is and tell her about your party. Will you take her a big kiss for me? Oh, sure. Come on, give me. Bend over so I can reach. Oh. There. Mm. Why, Mr. Mason. Do you mind if I play my record again? No, you go right ahead. What was the kiss for, Perry? Take back to Maine. Oh. You had a real nice idea, Mr. Mason, you old sentimentalist. Oh, now, Della. Sending me out shopping while you had May make that record. I know you. But it was real considerate, Perry. Very thoughtful. Ah, oh, you say that to all your bosses. I think Dory had a very good idea. Hmm? Bend over, Counselor. You deserve a nice set. Oh, saved by the bell. Darn. <laughs> <laughs> I'll get it, Bill. Mr. Grant. Why, no, I... Uh, this is the Grant house, right? Why, uh... I check the address. All right, this is the Grant address. I'm Perry Mason. Perry Mason. Oh, my lawyer. You got a message from Mr. Grant. He'll uh... do. You can take this message. What? From Mr. App. Special greeting from Mr. App. See this? This piece of paper says Mr. William Grant delivered the child known as Dory Grant to court in the morning. Uh, you want I should read the fine print or you got it? I got it. Okay. Uh, birthday party, huh? Yes, the child known as Dory Grant. Yeah? Well, happy birthday. What was it, Perry? Greetings from Mr. Rapp. Greetings and a birthday present. He subpoenaed Dory. Oh, Perry. Uh, that child. That poor baby. Do you know what he said, Della? What? The man said happy birthday. All right, Della, let's go deliver Mr. Rapp's present. Yes, Mr. Apt is a most thoughtful man. A man who thinks about his duty and his ambitions. And who is letting absolutely nothing stand in the way of getting May Grant convicted for murder. Even if it means dragging an innocent, vulnerable little girl before a grim court of law. Well, join us tomorrow, won't you?
have it. It's nine in the evening, more than an hour after the close of our last episode. As in the conference room of the city woman's prison... Oh, there she is. Yes. Thank you, Josie. Hello, Mr. Mason. Della? May. Sit down, May. <laughs> Josie says I'm a privileged character. Oh? Having conference with my lawyer any time of the day or night. Josie's feet must be bothering her. Mm. Tell me about the party. Did Dory enjoy your presence? Was she happy? And... Oh, just tell me everything. Oh, it was a wonderful birthday party, May. The finest birthday party ever. And Dory, did she... She had a wonderful time. I'm so glad. She loved all her presents. Everything would have been just perfect if, if you'd been there. But the recording you made for her was almost as good. Did she understand about the doll clothes? Hmm? I'm making new clothes for Manuel Jr., but they're not quite finished. Yes, she understood. Uh, May... Since she was sweet enough to stop by and tell me about it, tell me everything... How Dory looked, how Bill looked, and... What's the matter? May. Something is the matter. I can tell by the way... Mr. Mason. Apt has subpoenaed Dory. Subpoenaed? She's to testify in court tomorrow morning. Oh. At least the process server waited to come until after the ice cream. I'll see her. What? Tomorrow morning. In just a few hours, I'll see her. May. Yes, you'll see her all right. I know what you're thinking, and you're right, but it is terrible. Dory has to appear in court. For Dory's sake. Well, of course. I agree with you. I don't like it for your sake, either. But, Mr. Mason, I'll see you. May. We know that Apt might call Dory, and now that he has called her... I'll get to see her. Uh... You have to understand why he's called her, May. It was not to give you pleasure. Oh, You have to understand and prepare yourself. Apt has subpoenaed Dory for the same reason that he'd call any other witness. He thinks Dory will help put you in the electric chair. Mr. Mason. Why, if anything, whatever Dory might say would help me. You think so? Dory was with me almost every minute, Mr. Mason. She hated Marcel Blanc. She hates Kitty. Yes? And Dory loves me. Just as you love her. Yes. Dari isn't flesh of my flesh, but our love has made us just that close. May, you've missed the point. Hmm? Do you think Apt is a fool? No, he's a man who... No, whatever he is, he's not a fool. Don't you think that Apt knows how Dari feels about you? I don't want to think what you're thinking, Mr. Mason. Well, then that's too bad, because... Well, look, conducting your defense has been like walking a tightrope. Apt has thrown a lot of stuff at us, but we have managed to keep our balance. Harry can answer most of Apt's evidence with our evidence, May. Apt knows that as well as I do. He has got to knock us off the tightrope as fast as he can. Now, you love Dory. She loves you. But somebody you love can trip you just as quickly as somebody you hate. But you think Dory... You think Dory's going to trip me? Apt is not a fool. He wants to knock us over. He's called Dory. You figure it out. Now it's time to look a few facts in the face. All right. May, we understand that Dory won't want to hurt you. It's all right. Go on, Mr. Mason. Uh, well, it's just after 9 o'clock, and there's plenty of time for us to go over the whole thing again. Everything that's happened, May. Everything that Dory could have seen. Well, I've already told you twice. And those notes are typed and filed. Well, then why... We want you to tell us again, May. Go over it all again, then we'll take the new notes and compare them with the others. You just might have left something out. Mr. Mason, if you're so sure that Dory's testimony is going to hurt me, why bother with all this? Why? Oh. I have been talking about what Mr. Apt wants, May, not... What we want. What we want is to trip Mr. Apt just as badly as he wants to trip us. And he can be tripped, too. And by somebody that he loves. Who does he love? Mr. Apt loves Mr. Apt. Now, Mr. Apt has had everything coming his way. I mean, everything he has wanted. But if we dig deep enough, I'll find something to throw at him and knock him off his tightrope. You understand? Mm Mm-hmm. Why the smile? In spite of everything, I agree with Josie. Hmm? 
I am a privileged character. I'm going to see Dari in the morning. Yeah. Well, let's get to work. Well, I've been striking a match for you, my dear. Hmm? Oh, thank you, Mr. Hapt. Pour us another glass of burgundy. No, thank you. Hmm? Uh, one glass is my limit tonight. Tomorrow's an important day in court. Yeah. Uh, do you care if... No, I... one more. Eh? But don't forget, tomorrow's important for you, too. I won't forget. Uh, you'll see your little daughter. Yeah. Yeah. Don't drink that too rapidly, my dear. It's not strong enough to bother me. Uh, Mr. App. Hmm? Here, let me let me put the couch pillow behind you. I don't want to lean back. Oh? Mr. App, do you have to put Dari on the stand? I mean, would they make you just because you subpoenaed her? Well, no, no, I don't have to. Why? Well, Dari was right there in that apartment with May Grant and me. I know. And, of course, Marcel was coming in all the time. I know. And May Grant hates me, Mr. App. She's hated me ever since she stole my baby. She hated me even more after she went with Marcel and me. You know why. I know. So? So, well, you can teach a dog to hate somebody. What? You could. You could teach a dog to hate somebody. And May Grant taught Dari just as hard as she knew how, Mr. Apt. Oh. Every chance she got, she made Dari hate me. Oh, now, my dear. But she did. I know she did. Well, I understand. And that's why I'm, I'm wondering... Just what are you wondering, Mr. Collins? About putting Dari on the stand. That brat kid hates me. I mean, she's learned to hate me. It doesn't matter. But it, it doesn't it... matter. You don't know what they've got her primed to say. No. Well, they can make her say awful things. She won't get a chance to say them. Hmm? Huh? She won't get a chance to say them. Listen, it. To... Oh, wait. Wait, where are you going? Turn off the sentimental music. There's no place for sentiment in my thinking about Dory. No? Change your mind about having more wine? No, just a small glass. I've got to give you a blunt fact, my dear. Yes, a brutal fact. Yeah? And no matter how painful this fact is to you, it is my duty. Let's have it. Yeah. Now, you think of Dory as your child. Flesh of your flesh. The dearest person on earth to you. Yeah, sure. But I do not allow myself to feel that way. You don't like her? I neither like her nor do I dislike her. To me, she's a thing to use. Oh. A weapon. Yeah, like a gun. That's what I'm saying. She might turn against me. No. You keep saying that, because but I... Because I'm I... not worried. I know how to use my weapons, my dear. Now, this weapon has a safety. Hmm? Just that, a safety. Suppose the child doesn't react as I want her to. Suppose she does start giving unfortunate testimony. Yeah. I can always stop her. Now, I warn you, if I do have to stop her, it won't be pleasant for you. And it will be hard, oh, very hard on the little girl. But you can do it. I can do it, if it becomes necessary. I can smash her completely. Yeah? At any time I choose. I can make it impossible for her to continue. If it becomes necessary, of course. Oh, yeah, of course. But what, what, what would you do? Would you make her sick or something like that? Oh, not at all, not at all. Psychology, my dear. Psychology. Oh. But you can stop. Oh, yes. I hope, oh, I do hope it, it won't become necessary. But no one, not even a child, can stand in the way of justice. You'll see, my dear, you'll see. When we see Dory in the morning... Well, even if Perry Mason is successful, even if he does find a way to turn Dory's testimony to May's advantage, Mr. Apt is confident that that is a situation he can handle, even if the handling is a little rough on the child named Dory. But more of that tomorrow, so be sure to join us.
It's almost ten in the morning, and the day is lovely, bright, sunny. Even the grim and formal courtroom is a little warmer, more cheerful, with the sunlight coming through the windows. To May Grant, the day would be lovely even if the sky were gray with clouds. You see, May didn't sleep much last night, waiting for this day. And right now, as the guard leads her towards the defense table, as she sees her attorney... Miss Mason. Miss Mason. Hello, May. May. <laughs> well, what's that you've got in your hand? My present for Dari. Josie got me some paper to gift wrap it. Has Dari come yet? Is she here? Not yet, May. Oh. Oh, I can't wait to see her. Uh, sit down, May. I asked Josie to get pink ribbon, but all she could get was blue. Do you think blue's all right? Oh, I'm sure the blue's fine. I know her birthday was yesterday, but I didn't finish the doll clothes until... Well, I didn't sleep much last night. Neither did we, May. I... Oh? Oh, you went back to your office? You worked late? It was worth it, May. Worth... I'm sorry. I've been so full of waiting to see Dory. You I... forgot the warning we gave you. Since you told me Dory was going to testify, I... I haven't thought of anything, but you know. Yes, we do. Well, while we have a moment, I think we found something, May. Oh? I think we have found something in what you told us about Dory and you in that apartment. To use if Dory should say anything, well, damaging? Something to use, anyhow. And, uh, May, you'd better get set to hear Dory say something damaging. I suppose Mr. App will try to twist your words. Depend on it, he will. And that's why... May, you won't see Dory before she gets on the stand. Not see? But a a present. You'll have to give it to her later. But... uh... That's the way it will have to be, May. I'm trying to understand, Mr. Mason. I I know you know what's right, but... I've been so lonely for her. But if you say I can't... Mr. Abt won't let you, May. Oh... Oh, I see. I, I was being selfish and silly, wasn't I? Oh, of course not. We are Here they come. Oh. oh. Look at her. Oh, look at her. Yes, she darling, me. Do you think so? Do you really think so? She does... Oh, I can't help it. She does it. And she's grown. She has. Just in these past few weeks. Oh, look at her. Look at Bill walking beside her, so proud and so... She's seen me, she... Hello. Hello, darling. Hello, darling. Mommy sees you, darling. Mommy sees you. She's waving at me. She... Oh, they're turning the other way. Yeah, thank you, Perry. Hmm? Oh, oh, yes. Here. May. No, 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 don't say anything to her. Just give her the handkerchief. Here you are, May. Thank you. She'll be all right in a minute, Chief. Dory does look awfully sweet, doesn't she, Perry? Mm-hmm. How does Apt look? No, he's very sweet, too. You'd think that Dory was his favorite niece. I'd just like to hear what he's saying to her. Well, we'll all hear in just a moment. Uh, Della, talk to me, will you? See if she's straightened out. Dorothy, look at the door over there. That's where the jury is coming in. And that's where the jury... See them? See those people who... Dorothy, I... She waved at me. Did you see my mommy wave at me, Mr. Abt? Yes. Yes, I saw her. Couldn't I just... Now, child, I explained. But couldn't I just see her for a minute? You can see her. I mean, go... You can see her. Oh, all right. Dorothy. Yes, Mr. Abt. You'd like to talk to your mommy very much, hmm? You'd like that? Like to go put your arms around her and kiss her? Yes. Then I'll tell you what. Thank you, Mr. Abt. Thank you. Now, wait a minute, wait a minute. But you said... I said wait. Now, Dory, in just a minute, you're going to go up there and sit in that chair. The one with the steps going up to it. Oh, my mommy... Now, look at that chair, Dorothy. Now, Mr. Abt is going to make you a promise. If you sit in that chair like a big girl and answer the questions I'm going to ask you... Then I promise you can kiss your mommy and hug her all you want. You promise? If you answer the questions like a good girl. Will you remember? Do you promise? All right. 
I promise. All right, child. Walk up to the chair with me. And hold my hand. You hold my hand. Yeah, that's right. Come, Dory. Come, don't make me pull you. Ah, that's my girl. Now up the steps. Here, let me help you. I can do it. Let me help you. There. Now, comfortable? An awful big chair. Hmm, yes. Oh, Your Honor, as you can see, this witness is a mere child. I must request that the room be silent. I don't want our little lady to be afraid. Don't be afraid, child. I'm not afraid. Hello, Mommy. Remember, I promised Dorothy. Now, since this child is of such tender years, I move that the oath not be administered. No objection. I shall merely see it. Uh, how old are you, Dorothy? Uh, six years old. I had a birthday yesterday. You did? But tell all these nice people your name. Dory? Uh, no, no, all of your names. Oh. Dorothy May Gray. Just like my mom. <clears throat> Uh, now, Dorothy, a big girl like you ought to know what the truth is. What? I say you should know that a good girl tells the truth, and only a bad girl tells lies. Lie? Well, don't you know it's bad to lie? Well, I, I know it's bad to tell stories. Ah. Well, is, is a story a, a lie, Mr. X? A story is a lie. Oh. Now, my dear... All these nice people want to hear some things about you. They do? Indeed they do. For instance, who is your mommy, Dorothy? Well, she's sitting right over there with Mr. Mason. Oh, now, just a moment, child, just a moment. What is that lady's name? Mommy. No, no. What does, uh, what does Mr. Grant call her? Daddy. The man you call Daddy. Oh. Well, he calls her darling. Uh, no. No, what is her name? Oh. Dorothy May Grant. Just like mine, I told you. Hmm. And now, my dear, do you know that lady over there in the black dress? Now, what's her name? That's Mr. Carlo. Mr. Carlo. And what did May Grant tell you to call Mr. Carlo? Well, Mommy said to call her Mommy, too. I never could remember. Did May Grant tell you that Mr. Carlo was your real Mommy? Uh-uh, but, but she, Well, she really... for the sake of simplicity, uh, we'll, we'll drop that for the moment. All right. Now, I'm going to ask you some questions about May Grant and you. Is that all right? Uh-huh. You'll answer me? Uh-huh. And tell the truth. Yes. You love May Grant, don't you? Oh, yes. Very much? Lots and lots. I love you, Mom. Now, remember our promise. Yes, Mr. Rack. Now. now, Dorothy, even though you do love the woman you call Mommy... Will you tell the truth? What? I mean, well, what, what if she had on a dress that you didn't like? I like all her dresses. Well, uh, what if she got you a toy and then you didn't like it? Would you tell her? But, but I always do like the toys she gets me. And Daddy's too. But let's pretend, shall we? Let's pretend that she did get you a toy and you didn't like it. Now, do you understand? You're just pretending. Uh-huh. And if she asked you if you did like that toy, what would you tell her? If I really didn't like it. That's right. What would you say? Well, I... I... Well, I... I just have to say that... I was sorry. But I didn't like it. Ah. Then you'll tell us the truth. No matter if you hurt her feelings... I... Well, I have to tell the truth, Mr. Adams. Well, of course you do, my dear. Of course you have to tell the truth. Uh, do you know, Dorothy, you and I are going to be lovely friends. Lovely. Now, Dorothy, I'm going to start asking those questions. Well, the day that started out so beautifully for May Grant seems to suit Prosecutor Apt as well. Unknown to Perry Mason, Apt has boasted 
that if Dory should start giving damaging testimony, he can always stop her, even if the stopping is hard on the child. Be sure to join us on Monday by all means, won't you? It's immediately after the close of our last episode. Prosecutor Frederick Apt has just put Dory Grant on the stand and is about to question her. Dorothy. Oh, just a moment, Mr. Apt. Yes, Your Honor? I have a small word for the spectators. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to hear what this witness is about to say. The jury wants to hear. She's a little girl, and this is a big room. Unless you're quiet, we can't hear. Is that reasonable? All right. Now, Dory, I think we can hear you. Yes, sir. All right, Dorothy. Are you ready to answer my questions now? Uh-huh. Remember, you're going to be a big girl and tell the truth. Uh-huh. Even if it hurts somebody you love. You talking about Mommy? Well, let's say I mean Mrs. Grant or anyone else. Well, I wouldn't hurt my Mommy. Yeah. Well, stick to the point, Dorothy. Are you going to tell us the truth? Uh-huh. Well, now. Dorothy, we're going to talk about the time that you and Mrs. Grant lived with Mr. Carlo. Oh. You remember the time I mean? I remember. In the apartment where he used to come to see her all the time. He? Oh, oh, Mr. Blanc. Yes. That's right. Uh, Dorothy, will you answer my questions now truthfully? Let's see how well you remember. You and Mrs. Grant met Mr. Carlo and Mr. Blanc in another city. Uh-huh. Then you came to this city and went to an apartment? Uh-huh. We saw them in Chicago. In Chicago? Oh, now there's a bright girl. Now, my dear, I want to know what you did in that apartment. What? Well, were you shut up there all the time? Were you cold and hungry? Or were you given plenty of good food and warm clothing? And did you have all the toys that any little girl could possibly want to play with? That's right. No, no, you, you tell us. They gave me lots of toys. They? Who? M- Mr. Blanc and her. Mr. Carlo? Yes, but I just... Dorothy, know. what did Mr. Carlo give you to play with? Oh, a dollhouse. The washing machine. Why, weren't those nice toys? A dollhouse? You must have had a doll. Oh, yes. He was my favorite toy of all. Well. Manuel Jr. Well, he's right over there on your table. Oh, oh, is, uh, is this Manuel Jr.? Uh-huh. Could I have him, please? There's lots of room in this chair. Why, of course you may, child. Hi, he looks like a Spanish doll. Yeah, here you are. Thank you. No, Manuel Jr. is a Mexican doll. Sit still, Manuel Jr. Ah, so you had all those nice things to play with. Well, it must have been fun in the apartment. No. But with all those toys. I didn't play with them. What? Oh, but Dorothy, you just told us that doll was your favorite. Mommy gave me Manuel Jr. I didn't like their toys. Oh. Oh, Well, uh, to get on. She tried to make me play with them. But I wouldn't. Uh, Dorothy. She wanted to throw Manuel Jr. away. But Mommy wouldn't let her. Dorothy, I remind you once again not to speak except to answer questions. But we've only tried to... Only and answer the questions. Now, pay attention. Uh, Your Honor. Yes, Mr. Mason? I'd like to call to the attention of the court the fact that this child is only six years old. The court is well aware of Dorothy's age, Mr. Mason. Thank you, Your Honor. She's old enough to follow instructions. Just take it easy, Mr. Mr. Amp will take it easy, Mr. Mason. You needn't fear on that score. Your Honor, I'm laboring under difficulties with a witness of this age. Uh, What's he saying, Mr. Mason? That it's all right, Dory. But everybody's getting mad. It's all right, Dory. It will be when you sit down, Mr. Mason. Mommy? Could I go to Mommy? Your Honor, uh, can't you possibly... Yes, I believe I can. Uh, Dorothy. Uh, Dory. Yes, sir. Everybody was getting mad, huh? Yes, sir. Well, I'm not mad. You are? Not a bit. As long as we keep order. <laughs> uh, how would you like to come and sit up here? Would you like that? Way up there with you? Mm-hmm. There's plenty of room on this chair. 
Will he still ask questions? Well, in a minute, but you and I are going to have a talk first. Oh, I brought Manuel Jr. Well, that's fine. There's plenty of room for him, too. There, now. Oh, we're so high. He doesn't look so big now. I know, dear. Things have a way of leveling out from where we're sitting. Well, I don't understand. No, never mind. Mister. Uh, don't you know my name? Oh, I know it. It's awful hard to say. Do you think so? Well, try it. Uh, all right. Yes, sir. Um, Mr. Your Honor. The uh, what? Uh, Mr. Your Honor. That's what Mr. Mason called him. <laughs> oh, will you really hit them with that hammer? Sir? Well, I, um, well, it's an idea, honey. Uh, but uh, now we've got to answer Mr. App's question, shall we? All right. Go ahead, Mr. App. Thank you, Your Honor. The jury should know what happened in that apartment. Yes, sir, that's why if I... If you please. The way those people felt toward one another is important. And the way this child felt about them is also important. If she wants to tell about it, don't try to stop her. Do I make myself clear? Yes, sir. Very clear. And since the jury should know... Dorothy. Yes? Suppose you just tell us how you felt about Mr. Blanc and Mr. Carlo. Did you like them? No. Even after they bought you those nice, expensive toys? No. They didn't like me either. Now, just a moment. You mean you don't think they liked you? They didn't. I'll go on to the next point, but I remind the jury this child is expressing an opinion. What's he saying, Mr. Urana? Well, never mind, my dear. Just answer his question. How about Mrs. Grant, Dorothy? You did love her. I do love Mommy. But uh, just a moment, Your Honor. Mr. Raptus, come If you please, Mr. Mason, the fact that this child learned to dislike Mr. Carlo and Mr. Blanc and that she did love her so-called foster mother is most important. It gives weight to her entire testimony. Objection overruled. Uh, answering, Dory. What did he say? Did you love your, uh, Mrs. Grant while you lived in the apartment? I've always loved her. Just like she loves me. Ah. But, Dorothy, do you remember the last night you stayed in the apartment? The night before you went home? I remember. Who put you to bed that night? Mommy. Mommy always did. Hmm. And tell us what happened. Mommy talked to me and I went to sleep. And when you woke up? Uh Oh. Well, just tell us what happened. Was Mrs. Grant with you? No. Where was she? She was going out of the bedroom. You don't know what woke you up? She was gone. I called to her. How many times? I called and she answered me. Well, what did she say? She told me to stay in the bedroom. But I didn't mind her. No, wait, wait just a moment. She told you not to come out of the bedroom? But I didn't mind her. I was scared. I went out in the hall. But I did put my slippers on. Now, Dory, think carefully. What did you see when you went into the hall? I saw Mom. She was coming back from the living room. And what did you see her do? She stopped in front of the linen closet. Did she see you? No, I... I I didn't say anything. She told me to stay in bed, but... Well, go on, child. What did she do? She opened the door and stuck something in the sheets. Now, Dory, did you see what it was? Yes. What, Dorothy? What was she hiding? It was a toy. What? A toy pistol. Oh, a toy pistol. Now, you're sure it wasn't a real pistol? No, I've seen real pistols. At cowboy shows. And Daddy's got a real pistol. Real pistols are big. Oh. This was a teeny tiny pistol. So I knew it was a toy. Look here, Dory. Look at this. Hey, look at uh, what I have here in my hand. Do you know what this is? Oh, that's it. The little toy pistol. The little toy pistol. The little toy pistol with a tag on it. Of course, you can't read this tag. I can't read. No, you're too little. But you're big enough to remember, aren't you? Big enough to remember that this is the pistol you saw Mrs. Grant hiding. Yes, the little toy pistol. The little toy pistol that puts six little holes in... Six tiny holes... Tiny, but oh, so deadly. Little things can be deadly things, can't they, child? What's he saying, Mr. Your Honor? 
I don't know what he's saying. Never mind, Dorothy. You don't, but the rest of us do. I mean about the little deadly things. Well, let's get on, shall we? Well, perhaps Mr. Apt did take a chance putting Dory on the stand. But the chance seems to be paying off. In her innocence, Dory appears to be helping strap the woman she calls Mommy right into the electric chair, doesn't she? But more of this tomorrow, so join us by all means, won't you? Prosecutor Frederick Apt would be highly displeased if you called him a gambling man. But whether he thought of it as a gamble or dressed it up and called it a calculated risk... Mr. App knew he was taking a chance when he summoned Dory to give her testimony before open court. And right now, as App stands before Judge Selby's bench, as he looks at the golden-haired little girl who sits trustingly beside the judge, Mr. App is experiencing the thrill of a man whose gamble is paying off. Now the prosecutor lifts his hand again, so Dory can see the object he's holding, and... Dorothy, I'm going to ask you once again. Do you know what this is I'm holding up to you? The toy pistol. The pistol you saw Mrs. Grant hiding? Yes, the toy pistol. Toy? You aren't looking closely enough. Perhaps you'd better come down here. No. But I... I want to stay up here with Mr. Ron. Can I stay up here with you, Mr. Ron? It's all right, Dorothy. You, you don't have to come down. I just wanted you to be sure that it's the same gun. You're all right, Jake. So I can look at that gun all day without being positive it's the same. I'll rephrase the question. This looks like the same gun. Uh-huh. Hello, Mr. Mason. Hello, Dory. Now, just to clear the records, this gun is tagged with the initials of Police Lieutenant Arthur Trag. It is the same gun this girl saw Mrs. Grant hiding. The same gun that put six holes in the deceased. Is it a real gun? Of course it is. Yes, Dorothy. Now, ladies and gentlemen... I have here the statement, the sworn statement, given by Mrs. Grant to the police the night of the murder. Now, each page of this statement was initialed by Mrs. Grant. The complete statement is signed in full. I offer this document in evidence. Objections. This is a curious document, ladies and gentlemen. But that was a curious situation in the murder apartment. Curious and unhealthy. The state contends that Mrs. Grant was in that apartment with this child and the child's real mother for two reasons. One, she hoped to get her hands on the huge estate to which this child is heir. What's she saying, Mr. Dear Two, Mrs. Grant was in that apartment because Marcel Blanc, whom she loved, was a frequent visitor. A further, the state contends that May Grant's motive for murder grew out of these two reasons. She saw the money she coveted slipping away from her. And she saw the man she coveted, another woman's husband, mind you, slipping away from her, too. Your Honor. What, an objection, Mr. Mason? Just be sure you make it plain that what she said is the state's theory, not necessarily the true facts. Not until proven. That's right. I'm going to be fair, Mr. Mason. Oh, yes, very fair indeed. I'm going to tell the jury what Mrs. Grant claims was the true situation. Now, according to her statement, she didn't love Marcel Blanc. She was deathly afraid of him. She was a prisoner. No, oh, I don't wonder you're amazed. But listen, listen to the reason that Mrs. Grant says she feared him. Mrs. Grant claims that Mr. Blanc was going to have her killed. <coughs> That's right. She said Blanc intended to have her assassinated. She claimed she was to be killed the very night that Blanc was shot and killed. Amazing, isn't it? That the man she greeted with a fervent kiss before a restaurant full of people, that man whom she pleaded with to take her with him, that man whom the chambermaid heard May Grant say she would follow on her hands and knees, that's the man she feared with a deathly fear, who she said was keeping her a prisoner. Amazing. 
But there's more to her statement than that. Oh, yes. According to her story, Blanc gave her permission to tell this child goodbye. And then she was to be taken out and killed. But something happened. Well, she doesn't know what. But something happened. Someone, she said, came into the apartment and shot Blanc and left. You're about to see how amazing her story is. Dorothy. Yes, Mr. Apt. You didn't understand a lot of what I just said. No. Now we'll talk about something you do understand. That last night in the apartment. What happened at bedtime, Dorothy? Mommy put me to bed. Now go on. Tell us what happened. What, uh, what was different about that night? Different? Oh. <coughs> Mommy was going away. She told you? Mommy told me and he told me. Mr. Blanc? He told me, too. He told me Mommy was going home to Dad. Now, just a moment. Mrs. Grant was there when he said so? Uh-huh. Right by my bed. And what did she say when he said she was going home? Nothing. He said it. Well, what happened after that? Did Mr. Blanc stay with you? No. He went out of the bedroom. Right? Now, wait a minute. That left you and Mrs. Grant alone. Huh? Uh-huh. And was the door closed? Uh-huh. So nobody could hear what she said to you? There wasn't anybody else, just Mommy and me. Well, never mind. Tell us what she said. Well... Was, was she happy? Oh, no. She wasn't? She didn't want to go. Then why did she? She said he made her. Now, let's be sure about all this. Mrs. Grant didn't like it because Mr. Blanc was making her go away. She didn't want to go. Now, Dory, you and Mrs. Grant were alone. I told you. The door was closed. You were alone. Now, child, did Mrs. Grant say where she was going? What? Well, Mr. Blanc told you she was going home to her husband, going home to Mr. Grant. But what did she tell you? That she was going home to Dad. Home to Mr. Grant? Is that who you mean by Daddy? She told me that. Now, think, Dory, think carefully. She did tell you? Huh? I thought he was fooling. Mr. Blanc? Uh-huh. So I asked Mommy if, if she was really going home to Daddy. And? That's right. She was going to Daddy. She told me. You've just heard the important testimony, ladies and gentlemen. Now, this child is of tender years. But that moment of parting was important to her. You may be certain she remembers, and she remembers well. Oh, yes. May Grant was going to be taken out of that apartment, ladies and gentlemen. And she was unhappy. You heard this child say so. But you also heard what she told this child in the privacy of the bedroom. The prisoner was being freed. The prisoner was being sent back to her husband. Sent away by the man she passionately adored. Sent back to the husband she scorned. Well, she must have thought of that as a fate worse than death. It was the death of the man who sent her, the death of Marcel Blanc. The poet has said, Hell hath no fury like a woman scorned. May Grant was scorned, ladies and gentlemen. Scorned. Your witness, Mr. Mason. Hello, Mr. Mason. Hello, Dory. Are you going to talk to me now? That's right. I don't have to talk to him anymore? Well, not for a while. Can I come down and sit in the big chair again? Yes, if you want to. Come on, Manuel Jr. I'll take your time. What was he talking about, Mr. Mason? Mr. Rapp? Oh, don't you worry about it, Dory. Now, look, I'm uh, going to ask you some questions. And let's just think about them, hmm? All right. Uh, you want me to help you when you doll into the chair? No, I can do it. Oh, hmm? have you got a lot of questions, Mr. Mason? Quite a few. Are you tired? Well, not exactly. Well, what's the matter? Lean over just a minute. Hmm? Let me whisper. Oh, all right. How's this? Oh, uh, <clears throat> uh, could we have a short recess, Your Honor? Definitely, Oh, matron. Uh, Dory, just go with the matron. Yes, Mr. Mason. I talked to Bill Perry. Good. Did you get it? Yes, he brought the Bible. Give it to me. Oh, wait. Come over here, Della. Why? Oh, you're stepping in our hand. What's the matter? Apt. 
turn your back to him and hand me the Bible. Sure he isn't looking. Oh, is this all right? Yeah, fine. Well, then here you are. Thanks. Stay where you are while I put it in my pocket. I don't want to have to see it till I enter it in evidence. I don't believe he's thinking of anything but Mr. Carlo at the moment. Yeah, wait till Larry gets back. He'll think about this Bible in plenty. If it works, huh, Perry? Yes, if. Got a cigarette with you, Della? I think there's time for one before we get started. Well, if there ever was a time for courtroom fireworks, for Perry Mason to pull a rabbit out of his hat, this is that time. And it looks as if something is going to happen. Just what, you'll never know. Unless, of course, you join us tomorrow. It's a few moments after the close of our last episode. Almost time for the trial of State versus May Grant for the murder of Marcel Blanc to resume. As at the defense table, we hear... May. May. What? Oh, Mr. Mason. You tear your handkerchief to pieces. Don't worry. But I am. As your lawyer, I'm worried plenty. I'm not a lawyer, Mr. Mason. And those people on the jury aren't lawyers either. Everybody in this room knows how Dory's testimony makes me look. Like a thief, like an unfaithful wife, like a murderess. May, put down that handkerchief. Dory didn't want to say those things, but the way Mr. App made it sound, everyone... No, not up. everyone. I don't. Don't try to cheer me up, Mr. Pace. Thanks. Listen but... to me. I said I thought App made a mistake putting Dory on the stand. I still do. And more than that, everybody is going to see that mistake when they find out what Dory's testimony really meant. What? We hope Perry can show what Dory's words really mean. Right, here she comes now. Use that handkerchief to wave to her, May. And uh, keep your eyes open. Court is now in session. Thank you, Your Honor. Hello, Mr. Mason. Hi, Dory. You ready to talk? Well, just let me fix mine while you're Oh, late. yes, by all means. You must have your doll comfortable. Oh, yes. Yeah. There, yeah, he's all right. Mm. Ah, well, good. Now, Dory, I'm going to speak to the uh, ladies and gentlemen of the jury for a minute. You play with your doll while I do that, hmm? Grown-up talk? Mm, just for a second. All right, Mr. Mason. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, the prosecutor read into the record May Grant's statement of the night of the murder. Mrs. Grant said that Marcel Blanc was planning her own murder, that he gave her permission to tell Dory goodbye, and then she was to be taken out and killed. The state claims that Mr. Blanc was merely sending Mrs. Grant back to her husband, that she was in no danger, and that Blanc was spurning her love. Now, Mr. Amp used this little girl's testimony to support his claims. I would now like to take a close look at her testimony. Dory. Yes, Mr. Mason. Here, take a look at this book. Now, see if you can tell us what it is. Here, you hold it. Oh, it's my Bible. The Bible Mommy gave me. Uh, what is this, Mason? You heard the young lady apt. It's a small pocket Bible. Mommy gave it to me. Are you sure it's the same one, Dory? Oh, yes. Uh, Apt, would you like to examine it before I offer it in evidence? In case you were in any doubt, there's an inscription in front. I don't see what this has to do. You're about with... to. Uh, Dory. Yes, Mr. Mason. Now, I'm going to ask you to do something that isn't easy. I'm going to ask you to remember something just as hard as you can. All right, Mr. Mason. I want you to remember when you were given this book. And I want you to remember all you can that was said at that time. Now, just a minute, Mr. Mason. This is a six-year-old child. Mm -hmm. A six-year-old child who remembers very well. Uh, to quote you. Eh? Those are your words, Mr. Rapp. Would you like the court reporter to read them back to you? No, thanks. Mm -hmm. Now, Dory, tell us about it. Hmm? And even if you didn't understand all the words, you tell us all of them that you can. Hmm? Well, Mommy gave me my little Bible. Mrs. Grant? Uh-huh. The last night in the apartment. It was after he said she was going home to Daddy. And then Mr. Blanc left the room? Uh-huh. Now think, Dory. You told us a little while ago that your Mommy said that she was going home, too. 
Now, we want to know all about that. Everything she said that you remember. Go ahead, Dory. Everything you can. All right. Mommy sat down by my bed and she took my hand. I didn't want her to go and leave me, but she had to go. I remember she said... It's almost time for me to leave, Dory. I'd like to see you fast asleep when I walk out that door. Mommy. Oh, darling. Please don't cry. Please. Mommy, I... I want to go with you. I know, baby. But you can't go with me. He said you were going to Daddy. What? Oh. Aren't you, Mommy? Aren't you? Or was he just fooling? Mommy, was he... Dolly. He said you'd come back and get me. Was he fooling, Mommy? Dolly, I've never lied to you. I've never told you a story. Something untrue. No, Mommy. So now I'm going to tell you something bad and something good. What? Mr. Blank was fooling a little about me. I won't be coming back soon. <laughs> Don't cry. Listen and understand. And believe me, darling. Because it may be a long time before... Before you come back for me. Before anyone tells you the truth again. Mr. Blank was fooling... But you're going back to Daddy. So when he said he'd take care of me. Dolly, darling, he wasn't fooling about that. I'm sure you'd take very good care of you. I have to believe that. Daddy, Mr. Blunt said I believe was... that, too, darling. Go see Daddy. Someday, sometime. You'll come back for me. Sometime, darling. We'll be together again sometime. Somewhere. You sure? Very, very sure. Did Mr. Blunt tell you you could? No. Someone else. Someone else who always tells the truth. Who? Someone that you must learn to count on. God. Oh. Where are you going? To get a book. I've had it a long time. I'm leaving it for you, Dory. When you grow up and when you learn to read... I want you to read this book. Read it through and think about it. I don't expect you to understand now, darling. But promise me to try and remember. Try and remember to keep this Bible. Promise me, darling. I promise. I'm going to read us something from it. Something that's true. It's all I can give you, my baby. Are you ready to listen? Yes. All right, then. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. My rod, my stand, they come. And mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Daddy taught me all of it when I got home. It's the 23rd Psalm. I don't know what all the words mean, but it's pretty. It's awful pretty. And I always think of Mommy when... Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. The valley of the shadow of death. And the child asked, Will you see Daddy? Will you see me again? And May Grant answered, Someday, darling. Someday, sometime, somewhere. You all know the place and time she meant, ladies and gentlemen. The place and the time on the other side of the valley. The valley of death. May Grant thought she was going to be killed. 
But she had courage enough to find a way around telling a lie to the little girl she loved more than life itself. Now, Dory, one thing more, honey, and that's about all. Now, some people haven't believed that you and Mrs. Grant were actually held prisoners, have they? What? Oh, I should be ashamed of myself. You're tired, aren't you, darling? I, I would like a glass of water. Yes, of course you would. And a chance to get off that chair and move around before I ask any more questions. Your Honor, uh, could we have a short delay while Dory gets a drink of water? Oh, Your Honor, I... You what, Mr. Rapp? Object to this child getting a drink of water? Object to her moving around a bit? I... No, no. Get your glass of water, child. Get your glass of water. Not that it will help you any. No, Your Honor, I have no objections to a short delay. Things aren't going at all well for Mr. Apt. In fact, it looks as if his gamble in putting that child on the stand is going to turn into a losing gamble. That's what Kitty DiCarlo warned him might happen when Apt first mentioned using Dory. We're going to learn more about that tomorrow, so by all means, join us. It's immediately after the close of our last episode. As in Judge Selby's courtroom, we hear... May, wait. Oh, let her go. Let her go, Della. But, Chief, I... Nothing is as important as getting to that poor child now. This is. What? The doll. Monroe Jr., Dory's doll. May! Let me go to it, Della. I wouldn't stop you for the world, May. I just want to give you this. Monroe Jr. Yes. Mexican doll. Yes. I... Thank you, Della. That's all right, May. No... Go to it, May. Go ahead inside. And give her our love. Oh, it's dark. Dory? 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 Oh, Dory, baby. Where are you, Dory? It's so dark in here, I can't... Dory, where are you? Is that you? Oh, baby, baby. Is that my baby all huddled up in a dark corner? All huddled up like a poor, frightened little... Oh, Charlie, darling. Let Mommy take you. It's Mommy, darling. Your Mommy. Your Mommy's come to you, darling. Look at me. I love it, any Mommy. The tea runner said so. Oh, Mommy. Come here, baby. Let your mommy hold you. Mommy. Hush, baby. Baby. Mommy's got you, darling. It's all right now. That's it, John. Put your head against my neck. Put your arms around me. All right. All right. Mommy. I'm just taking you to the chair, darling. So we can sit down together. <laughs> now you're on Mommy's lap. So we to cut. Remember? It's been so long. So very long. I can't stop crying. Hush, darling. I can't stop. Well, don't try. <laughs> cry all you want. I don't want to. Well, I feel I cry. Oh, I'm so glad to be with you, darling. I could just cry my eyes out. I could be with you. Are you, darling? Are you sure? Yes. <laughs> but he told me you couldn't... Hush, maybe. He said you couldn't even see me. That wasn't it, darling. That wasn't it. But... I'm here... You're on my lap. Right here. With my arms around you. And I brought your doll to you. Did you hear me, darling? I brought Manuel Jr. in. He's over there on the couch. Well, he's here. 
<laughs> she rather told me that... <laughs> when Judge Selby told you that I... I'm not really your mother. <laughs> you run away. <laughs> You're not my mommy. But that isn't why you ran away, Dory. Did you hear me, darling? <laughs> what? You didn't feel bad because of what Mr. Yorana said? Now, lift up your head, darling. Lift up your head. Look at me. And here. Get down off Mommy's lap and sit on the chair. Just... Oh, Mommy, don't. I won't. I'll be right back. I'm going to raise the fly. Oh, your right hurts. But it's better when you see things the way they are. Hmm? Oh, Mommy. I'm not going anyplace. I'm just getting Manuel Jones. <laughs> Manuel Jr. was lonesome all by himself. Wouldn't you like to have him come sit with us? I would. Thank you, Mommy. You're welcome, sweetheart. Now, let me lift you and Manuel Jr. up on my lap. There. Oh, Mommy. I must... Now, wait, darling. Listen to me, will you, darling? Try to understand. Yes. Honey, Judge Selby... He didn't say we couldn't see each other anymore. But he did. He said... Hush. You didn't understand. You felt bad because you didn't understand. I heard him. He did. Larry, what he said was... He said, I'm not really your mommy. Yes. That, that's it. Now, wait, darling, wait. He said, I'm not really your mommy. But if you'd listened to him very carefully, you'd have known that he didn't say that you weren't my little girl. Because, you see, you are my little girl. You couldn't be anything but my little girl. Uh, You've always been my little girl, darling. Always. And, honey, that hasn't changed. I love you. I've always loved you. I always will love you. But you aren't really my mommy. Darling, in every way, but in just one way, I'm your mommy. What? I love you. As much as any mommy could love her little girl. I, I love you, you too. Of course you do. And if I love you, and you love me, that makes makes me your little girl. You are my little girl. But I... now hush, and let me tell you something else. You and I, we're special. Special. Hmm? You see, you weren't with me when you were a tiny, tiny baby. W where was I? Well, for a little while, you were with somebody else. Oh. But, Dory... Where? Dory, if, if you had been with me always, then you'd have to call me Mommy. Then, then you'd have to. Then you'd have to be my little girl. And that's why I say that you and I were special. You see, this way, I'm your Mommy and you're my little girl because we want each other. Because I want you to be my little girl. Oh, and I, I, I want you to be my mommy. That's it. That's it. Now do you understand? Oh. Now this way, isn't it ever so much nicer? But... Yes, darling. If... If I was with you all the time... Yes, darling. Don't some little girls stay with their mommies all the time? Yes, most little girls. C could you... Could... I love you just as much, darling, just as much as if you'd always been with me. And Daddy loves you just as much, too. But I, I wasn't with you. But it doesn't matter, darling, really. Really, really, it doesn't matter. It was only such a little while that you weren't with me. Oh? Just... Oh, Manuel Jr. sliding off. Don't let him fall. No, of course we won't let him. We'll put him... Do you want to hold him? Yes, please. He was lonesome. Darling, you love Manuel Jr., don't you? Not like you love Daddy and me, but... You really do love Manuel Jr. Yes. Darling, where did you get him? We... We got him in, in the railroad station. But you saw him, remember? You saw him... And you wanted him? Yes. But he was already there, wasn't he? He was already in the railroad station at the stand. 
Yes. At the stamp. Would... But why, Mommy? He was already there. But you saw him. And you wanted him. And you got him. Now you love him. Yes. He didn't have to be with you from the start, did he? You loved him from the first time you saw him. Sorry, Mommy loved you right from the first time I saw you. Oh? You're not a doll. You're my own precious little girl. But you can see, can't you, darling? You're mine. And I'm yours, and that's the way it always will be. Always, always, and always. Oh, Mommy. Oh. You're all right now. Yes. Mommy. Yes, dear. Little girls don't come from stores, do they? Or from stands? What? They don't, do they? I've never seen little real babies in stores. Oh, sorry. Oh, 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 I love you, sweetheart. And I love you, Mom. I really, really do. <laughs> What you've just heard may grant healing Dory's hurt, reassuring her in her bewilderment. It's going to have a profound effect on May Grant's own fate. And you'll see why in our next episode. So join us tomorrow by all means, won't you? It's early afternoon, about an hour after the close of our last episode. As on the sixth floor of the court building, in the waiting room of Dr. Kenyon, juvenile board psychologist, we hear... Oh, here they are, Della. Hello, Doctor. Mr. Mason. Hello, Mr. Mason. Well, how's my girl, Dory? Ah. Hello, Dory. Well, don't I get a hug, too? Oh, yes, Mr. Oh, bless your heart. How is she, Doctor? Frankly, I'm amazed. Yes? Mr. Mason, Dr. Kenyon said I could see Mommy again. Oh? Later this afternoon. For just a little while. Oh, uh, Adela. Mm-hmm. Oh, uh, Dory. Look, don't I see a blackboard over there? And look, honey, here's some chalk. Would you draw me a picture, Mr. Well, well, Doctor? Mrs. Grant didn't spend more than 20 minutes with that child. But the change in her, it... Well, you can see for yourself. Yes, well, Dory loves me. Yes. You know, I've been following the trial in the newspapers, Mr. Mason, and up to now, I'm afraid I believe Mrs. Grant was guilty. But actions speak louder than words, and I can't see a woman who's earned love like she has being a killer. She isn't, but I have to prove that in court. Oh. Well, how long will you have to keep Dory on the witness stand, Mr. Mason? Only a few minutes more, if that isn't too much for her. She's tired, but uh, it's important. Very. Of course, we can wait. No, let her finish today, Mr. Mason. Get it behind her. I'll give you written permission. Thank you, Dr. Kenyon. Odella! Coming, Terry. Dr. Kenyon says Dory can complete her testimony. Oh, I was sure she was, all right. You can see from the way she's acting. Well, you agree that actions speak louder than words, too, huh? What? I think that. And I believe that most eminent psychologist, Frederick Apt, thinks it also. What, that actions speak louder than words? Yes. And if I can make him take the action I want, his actions will not only speak, Mr. Frederick Apt will stand up and yell. What are you talking about? (laughs) Come on back in court, Della. I'll show you. That's right, Mr. Rapp. There has been some question about the persons this witness has referred to. So, will you stand up, Mrs. Grant? That's right. Now, please stay where you are at the defense table. Now, Mr. Carlo, you stand up. Now, don't move, Mr. Carlo. Why, what is your objection, Mr. Rapp? You were the one who said there was confusion in Dory's testimony. Uh, well, all right. Stand up, Mr. Carlo. Now, Dory, do you know those two ladies standing there? Uh-huh. Will you tell me their name? Oh, well, that's Mommy standing beside Miss Grant in the street. Hello, Mommy. Uh, Dory, will you tell us her name so that we'll know that you know? Oh, Mommy is Mrs. Dorothy May Grant. Uh-huh. And the other lady, the one standing uh, behind Mr. Rapp? Mr. Carlo. Good. Now, Dory, we got all mixed up this morning, uh, and since actions... Speak louder than words. What, Mr. Mason? Suppose you finish telling us what happened the day you tried to leave that apartment. Oh, all right. Now, Dory, when you mention Mommy or Mr. Carlo, 
Use their name. Hmm? And so there won't be any doubt at all. Point your finger at the lady you mean. Like this? Point just like that. Now, let's see. Now, you were all alone that day, weren't you? Mommy was there. Well, use her name, Dory, and point. Oh, oh. Mrs. Grant was there. She, Mr. Carter, was going away with him. Mr. Blanc? Hmm? So we went downstairs. Who, Dory? Her, Mrs. Grant. We went downstairs and tried to go outside. And what happened? A man stopped us. Did you know him? No, but he wouldn't let us go outside. You asked? Well, Mommy, she, Mrs. Grant, asked. But he wouldn't let us. He said Mr. Blanc would be mad because we tried to leave. I see. And so? We went back upstairs. I started to cry. And Mommy, uh, that's Mrs. Grant, she carried me. Crying because you didn't want to go back? That's right. She, I mean Mrs. Grant, she cried too. We didn't want to go back. Why not, Dory? We didn't like it there. Why? Objection. Defense counsel has had access to this witness during the past hour. Undue influence could have been... Oh, Mr. Raft, I saw Dory only in the company of Dr. Kenyon. If you like, I'll bring the doctor in here, put her on the stand, and get her statement. Uh, Well, Mr. Raft? Objection withdrawn. Thank you. All right, now, Dory. Why didn't you like that apartment? Well, she... That woman, Mr. Carlo, didn't like me. I object to this line of questioning unless Dorothy can give a specific instance of abuse or mistreatment. Well, uh, Dory, did Mr. Carlo ever beat you or hit you or... Oh, no. Mommy wouldn't let her. Oh, I see. Well, uh, what about Mrs. Grant? Was she good to you? Oh, yes. She was always nice. She never got mad. I mean, at me. But one time when Mr. Carlo... Oh, well, that's, that's all right, Dory. I was just going to tell you when she tried to burn Mr. Carlo. Did I say something wrong? No, no, Dory, not at all. Now, we thank you very much. All right, sit down, Mrs. Grant, Mr. Carlo. Uh, you can get down now, Dory. Oh, no, she can't. What? Just stay right there, child. I've got a question now. Oh? He's snapping at it, Ella. What? He's snapping at it. Snapping at what? The bait, the bait. Wait, listen to him yell. Now, Dorothy, you just told us that Mrs. Grant was always sweet and kind. Uh-huh. But, as Mr. Mason said, actions mean more than words. My daddy says that, too. Now, let's hear of the action Mr. Mason stopped you from telling us about, Dory. When Mrs. Grant tried to burn Mr. Carlo. Oh, did it really happen? Uh-huh, in the kitchen. There was a pan of water on the stove. It was a gas stove. And was the water boiling? Uh-huh. And Mommy, Mrs. Grant, took the pan of water and made Mr. Carlo run away. Oh, she did, did she? Uh-huh. So the sweet, kind, even-tempered Mrs. Grant, who never got mad, flew into a murderous rage, did she? She tried to burn Mr. Carlo with the water. She was so mad. There you are, ladies and gentlemen. There is an action that tells you a lot about the defendant. That's all, Dorothy. Oh, I'm uh, sorry, Dory, but now I have a question. What? You didn't tell us all about what happened, Dory. You haven't told us why Mrs. Grant tried to burn Mr. Oh, Carlo. Oh, Your Honor. You opened this door after I'm questioning Dory about part of the same action you did. Now, Dory, why did she try to burn Mr. Carlo? Because of the milk. What? Mr. Carlo tried to give me some milk. And there, I... now you've heard the reason. Let the child step down. Right? Wait, Ap, wait. Was that all that was in the glass, Dory? Just milk? No. No, Mommy and I were cleaning the refrigerator. I mean, Mrs. Grant. Mrs. Grant had some milk for my lunch. Oh, Mason, we've labored this time. Uh, go on, Dory. Well, just had time to clean the refrigerator before lunch. And then she, Mr. Carlo, got up. Got and... up? Up out of bed and came into the kitchen. Mom, Mrs. Grant was putting some milk bottles on the back porch when Mr. Carlo came into the kitchen. Oh, wait, now, you say that she had just gotten up. How do you know that? She had on her bathrobe and slippers. She never got up until just before lunch. Objection. Oh, never mind. Uh-huh. So what happened, Dory? Mr. Carlo saw the milk. She poured some in a glass and... She got some other stuff out of another bottle, a green bottle. Mr. Carlo called it rum. She called it rum, Dory? You're sure? Well, she called it that, and I said we needed the milk for lunch. And that's when she said... Uh, who, Dory? Mr. Carlo. She said, all right, if I wanted some milk, I could have some of hers. 
Uh, wait, Dory. Some of hers that she had mixed with that stuff from the green bottle? Uh-huh. I didn't want any. It didn't smell so good. But she tried to make Tried me... to make you drink it? Yes. I cried. Then Mommy came back and saw her. Mrs. Grant? Mrs. Grant. She saw me crying. She saw what Mr. Carl was doing. And Mommy... Mrs. Grant got mad. Mrs. Grant got mad. Picked up that water and... Oh, she was awful mad. Yes, Dory, I'll bet she was awful mad. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, isn't it beginning to complain? The deeper we go, the more truth we see in May Grant's statement at the time of her arrest. She said she was a prisoner. And by any definition, May Grant and Dory were prisoners. If you're locked up against your will, you're a prisoner. That's all. And as for this last, well, May Grant is human, ladies and gentlemen. Not a murderess, but human. And is there a human being in this room who can blame her for getting awful mad? May Grant loves this baby. How do you think she felt when she saw that woman? And I'm talking about the one right over there behind you, Mr. Rapp. When she saw that woman trying to force liquor down this child's throat. Can you blame her? That's all, Dory. Mr. Rapp doesn't have any more questions. At the start, Mr. Apt paid Perry Mason lip service as being a master courtroom strategist. But those were just words. Now, Mr. Apt is seeing Perry Mason in action. And Mr. Apt doesn't feel quite so confident. Well, be sure to join us for tomorrow's important and exciting development. It's early evening. Several hours after the close of our last episode, as in front of Della Street's apartment building, we hear... Here I am, Perry. Hmm? Oh, good. Oh, my, you look nice, Della. Very nice indeed. I smell good, too. New perfume. Oh? Where'd you park the car? Oh, uh, wait. Isn't there a florist shop in this block? A florist? Hmm. Why, yes. Come on, I'll show you. You don't usually give me flowers until after you've won the case. Yeah, uh, yes, that's true. I uh, thought you were a little set back this afternoon when Mr. Apt agreed to put Kitty on the stand. But since we located the witnesses who will give Kitty her alibi, and since we know what to do about them... Hey, did I give you that insurance report at the office? Oh, yes, yes. Oh, I'm okay. all ready for them. But, um, well, I, I, I don't know how to tell you this, Stella. But um, you'll have to wait for your flowers. Oh, well, at least until we're sure Mr. Rapp doesn't have the key to the trap I've set for him. The, uh, the flowers are for a lovely lady. Uh, another lovely lady. Thanks. Anyone I know? Uh-huh. Who? Uh, let's go in. Mmm, ah, you do smell good. That's the flowers, silly. Oh, yes, sir. Oh, I would like to order some roses, please. Roses, yes, indeed, sir. And does the young lady wish red or white? Uh, they or... aren't for me. Oh. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought... Oh, it's a natural mistake. I made it myself. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> a dozen of the red, if you please. Oh, yes, sir. Uh, to be delivered or... Yes, to be delivered. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. it takes me a moment to pack them, sir. Well, we won't wait. I'll just leave a card. Oh, yes, sir. Oh, they're lovely. Mm -hmm. uh, they are for a Mrs. Morgan at... Uh, well, here... Here's her address. You can copy that. Yes, sir. I'll get you one of our special cards. All right. So that's Mrs. Morgan. Mm -hmm. Well, she sure deserves bouquets. Mm -hmm. She deserves more than that. If she hadn't posed as Kitty DiCarlo and helped locate those witnesses... Here you are, sir. Oh, yes. Thank you. Uh, that's all right. I have my own pen. Yes, sir. Oh, pardon me, sir. Mm-hmm. Peerless flower shop. Oh. Oh, yes, sir. Mr. Frederick Apt. Yes, sir. Harry. Hmm? Of course, Mr. Apt. Oh? A half dozen of the red. Yes, sir. And will you pick them up, or shall I, uh... Yes, sir. They'll be waiting. Oh, and Mr. Apt, may I offer my congratulations, sir? I 
How is this for a coincidence? I've been following the case in the papers, and... Uh, uh, you're certainly welcome, sir. And thank you. Uh, yes, sir. I'll leave the box open so you can put in your card. Goodbye, Mr. Happ. They'll be waiting for you. Oh, uh, excuse me. I, I couldn't help overhearing. But was that Mr. Frederick Happ? Oh, yes, indeed. That's the prosecutor. The famous prosecutor. Oh, we have some very important customers. Well. Just at the moment, Mr. App is prosecuting... Uh, you've been following the case by any chance? Well, yes, we are rather familiar with it. I'll tell you something. Do. That defense lawyer, Mason? Oh, yes, Mason. Mason doesn't have Mr. App worried a bit. No? No. Mr. App is in excellent spirits. There was some speculation in the papers today after the defense demanded Mr. Carlo's testimony, but I can personally tell you Mr. App isn't worried. Well, fine now. Now, here, if you'll uh, take my card. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes, sir. I'll put it right in the box. Uh, hmm. Something the matter? <laughs> you, you signed this very uh, Mason. It happens to be my name. Well, well now... Isn't that a coincidence? Uh -huh. Oh. I'll pay you for those now. Oh, yes, Mr. Mason. It, it'll be $12, sir. All right. Here you are. And 12 And now I will tell you something. Please, Mr. Mason, now I didn't... To mean... tell Mr. Apt when he comes in to pick up his flowers. You tell him Mr. Mason isn't worried either. Will you do that, hmm? Yes, sir. See the flowers get right out to Mrs. Morgan, all right? it look like? Mr. Apt's coming to visit. Mm, I wondered why the perfume... Well, he happens to like it. So much? Mm-hmm. He wants to rehearse my testimony. But I'm not going to talk about the trial all night. No. He likes perfume. Well, that beer smell, you better get out of here, Anna. You know, sometime you're going to come barging in and he'll be here. I didn't expect to see Mr. Rapp. Mm. Who'd you expect, Vanek? That stocking seems straight enough. No, John, either. Then who? Hmm. <laughs> What's up, Anna? Kitty, I just got a phone call. Yeah? From Mona Lee. Who? Mona Lee Fox, dearie. One of your witnesses. So what? She phoned me from the Tittle Bar. She works there. <laughs> but you know where that is, don't you, dearie? Me? Don't give me that innocent look. Anna, what's this all about? Don't you ever learn? Didn't Jacobson teach you? I don't know what you're talking about. All right, I'll tell you. You were out drinking. Me? Last night with a man. You must be nuts or something. I never you let little you... little fool. Keep away from me. You Anna. want to wreck everything? Now, wait, Anna. Let me tell you. Who was he? Anna, wait. Come out from behind that chair. Now, you tell me. Stop or... it, Anna. Eddie. I didn't go out of this room last night. I warned you not to. Apt was here last night. Mr. Apt, now you know that. Yes, but after he left. No, Anna, I didn't. Don't lie to me. I'm not lying. Did Mona Lee say I was... If she said I was in the turtle bar, she was lying. Either she, she was lying or mistaken. She wasn't lying. And she wasn't mistaken. She saw you. And Richard Lappin saw you. They couldn't have. Now, wait a minute, Anna. Did she call just to say I she was in the room? She called report. And she mentioned seeing you. Oh? About midnight. But Mr. Apt was here until... Anna, don't look like that. They saw somebody else. They couldn't have. Well, why not? There's somebody who looked like me. They've never seen me. No. Well, just, just pictures of me. They, they could be mistaken. Possibly. Well, that's just a coincidence, Anna. Somebody else who looks like now me. That's that... stretching coincidence too far. Uh-huh. Mona Lee spoke to you. She what? Mona Lee is smart. She's going to alibi you. And it looks strange if she hadn't recognized you. Oh, and then she spoke. She said, she good spoke. evening, Mr. Carlo, and you answered. 
I answered. So you see, dearie, that's what I said. Well, wait. Wait, what time was that? About midnight. All right, Anna. I can prove it. You haven't seen Vanek? Not since I talked to Mona. Why? John saw Mr. App leave last night. Hmm? He did. You can ask John. Just ask him. He'll tell you it was after midnight when App left. Just ask John. I will. Before you have a chance to speak to him. He'll tell you, Anna, unless he lies to get me in touch. John won't lie to me. So, okay, it was somebody else, Anna. It had to be. You told me the truth. I have. It was somebody else who looked like You me. think so, huh? What else? Somebody who looked enough like your picture to fold Mona Lee. <laughs> somebody with your name... Oh. That's a little too much coincidence, dearie. Yeah. Gee, what's it mean, Anna? I don't know. Trouble? Trouble? No, not trouble. At least, not trouble I can't handle. I'm worried, Anna. I, I... Don't you worry, sweet. Don't you worry one second. Not if John backs your story. Oh, he will. Well, then, don't you even think about it, dearie. Just see that Mr. Apt has a pleasant evening. Anna, what, now, what if Miss... Now, Mr... don't you bother, baby. Do you hear me? And I'll think it over. Oh, yes. You may be sure and I'll think it over. Now then, do you want a vase, Catherine? <laughs> do you think Mr. Raft is likely to bring you some flowers? Well, if Frederick Apt were the only antagonist he had to face, Perry Mason wouldn't have as much cause to worry. But behind Mr. Apt and Kitty, behind everything that's happened to May Grant, is Anna B. Hurley. And now that Anna is alerted, well, join us tomorrow by all means. It's 11 in the morning. Judge Selby's court has been in session for an hour. An hour during which Kitty DiCarlo has been on the witness stand and, under Prosecutor App's expert direction, has been making a well-planned and beautifully executed play for the jury's sympathy. But, curiously enough, defense counsel Perry Mason doesn't seem worried or bothered, or even very much impressed as... Uh, can you continue now, Mr. DiCarlo? I'll try. Oh, dear. Uh, let, me, let me get you a glass of water. Mm. Poor Mr. Carlo. Mm. She's sick. Anybody would look sick with no lipstick on. It's a beautiful act. Shame to break it up. Hmm? Hey, what are you doing with my purse? Well, it's time for me to get into this act. What are you looking for in my purse, Perry Mason? Ah, aspirin. Oh, yeah, sure. I always carry it. And cough drops. That's all. Thank you, Dylan. Oh, Mr. Apt. Hmm? No, yes, Mason. Before you give Mr. Carlo that water, I have some aspirin for her. Aspirin? Well, now, isn't that thoughtful, Mr. Mason? Why, it's nothing, really. <laughs> Here you are, Mr. Carlo. Oh, wait. Hmm? Uh, let me see. Oh, it has aspirin stamped right on the tablet, Mr. Apt. Surely you don't think that I would offer your witness something else. Oh, my, no. Now, uh, watch it. Don't spill the water. Huh? Oh, yeah. Uh, here you are, Mr. Carlo. And here is your aspirin. Thanks. <clears throat> Thanks so much. Oh, and that isn't all. Uh-huh. Now, since you seem to have a slight cough... Oh, she has, Mr. Mason, a severe case of laryngitis. <coughs> oh, pain is terrific. But Mr. Carlo insisted on giving her testimony. Yes, well, of course, later, if she gets tired... Oh, if she gets too tired, then, uh, well, we just have to give her a rest. Especially if I am cross-examining? We have to think of Mr. Carlo's throat. <coughs> Mr. Mason... Mr. Apt. Yes, Your Honor. I hate to disturb you two gentlemen. Well, that's all right, Your Honor. But don't you think we might get on with this trial? By all means, sir. But uh, now first, uh, let me give Mr. Carlo these. What's that? Uh, some cough drops. Ah, oh, Mr. Mason, you're too kind. Oh, I'm not at all, Mr. Apt. Now, do you think, Mr. Mason? Uh, 
Yes. Order, please. Can Mr. Carlo go on, Mr. F? I'll ask her. Uh, Mr. Carlo? I'll try. Then I suggest that you get started. Now, please don't tire her unnecessarily. Suppose you listen, too, Mr. Mason. Yes, yes, Your Honor. Mr. Carlo. Yes, sir. Will you interrupt me if you begin to tire? Huh? Uh, I will. Uh, uh, Mr. Carlo, a certain testimony was given at this trial about an incident. An incident which occurred in the apartment where your husband was killed. Uh, yes, sir. At the time, Mrs. Grant threatened you with physical harm. Which, uh, <coughs> which time was that? Well, there were several times. Oh, yes, sir. Oh? Well, uh, first tell us about the, uh, the time that she tried to burn you. Oh, that time. We have heard one version of the story. I know. Poor Darius. And now, uh, unless you're tired. <coughs> oh, no, sir. I, I want the truth to be known. I want it to be a matter of record. Good, good. It happened while I was sick. Sick? Yes, sir. A, a, another attack of laryngitis. Oh, I see. I had drugs, but I don't like to take drugs, and the doctor had prescribed a cup of hot milk punch. Uh, uh milk punch? Just what? Well, uh... it's a, a little rum and hot milk. Oh, yes, yes, uh, for your throat. Mm -hmm. Well, there was a bottle of rum in the kitchen cabinet. I dragged myself out of bed to heat the milk. Well, couldn't someone have done it for you? I didn't ask Mrs. Grant to fix things for me, Mr. Aft. I was awful careful of what I ate or drank. Your Honor, that statement is irrelevant. Your objection sustained. Strike the part of her answer after I didn't ask Mrs. Grant to fix things for me. All right, Mr. Ed. Yes. All right, Mr. Carlo. Uh, you went to the kitchen. Well, Dari was in there alone. I, I got the bottle of milk and started to mix in the rum, and Dari said that was all the milk we had. <coughs> had. So I said... <coughs> I said I'd get some more as soon as I got dressed. Yes, yeah, so uh, go on. Well, a little child needs her milk. Of course. Well, Dari and I were just standing there talking. <clears throat> Mrs. Grant didn't give me much chance to talk to my little girl. Oh, Your Honor. Now, just, just tell us what happened, please. Yeah. Well, I didn't use all the milk, so I asked Dari if, <coughs> if she wanted a glass. Oh, now, wait. Uh, you offered Dari plain milk. <laughs> plain Oh, yes, Mr. Abb. Why, anybody who'd offer rum punch to a little girl, well, I wouldn't do that. Yes, I thought not. Well, I, I didn't notice, but Mrs. Grant had sneaked back to the kitchen and we were standing behind me. And you didn't see her? Well, not until all of a sudden she flew in there like a banshee. Oh. She was yelling I was trying to give liquor to Dory. No. Oh, yes, and she, she, she did. She picked up a pan of boiling hot water and she tried to burn me. Oh, poor lady. Oh, I know what Dory told you all. And I don't blame that child for one minute being mixed up. No wonder she was mixed up with that woman telling her things. Your Honor, just confine yourself to what you know, Mr. Carl. Yes, Your Honor. You say there were, uh, there were other times when Mrs. Grant tried to harm you. Oh, sure. Do you want me to tell you about the time? Uh, just a moment, Mr. Carlo. Mm -hmm. uh, rest your throat for a minute. Hmm? What's this, Mr. Mason? <laughs> well, I didn't object to Mr. Carlo's giving her side of that rum punch story. It was already in the record. And you have no grounds to object now. Yes, Mason, what's the question? Well, I know that we want to find out what happened in that apartment, Your Honor. And that's why Dorothy was allowed such latitude in her testimony. Oh, yes. Uh, yeah. It was made plain that there were limitations to the weight of Dory's story. Eh? Why, why, certainly, since she's just a child. Yes, the restriction of her age was carefully pointed out to the jury, Mr. Rapp. There is also a restriction to the weight that should be given Mr. Carlo's testimony. Oh, come now, Mason. She has laryngitis. Oh, I'm not talking about her health, Mr. Rapp. I'm certain she's as healthy as a horse. What? Just what are you getting at, then, Mr. Mason? Why, I think the jury should be informed that Mr. Carlo is also a murder suspect. What <laughs> was that? I'm sure you heard me, Mr. Rapp. I said a murder suspect. And the jury should take into account the fact that... How can what? you say that, Mr. Mason? This, this poor woman... This poor woman whose child was stolen, whose dearly beloved husband... That is the point. Eh? You have done your best to show that Mrs. Grant was in love with Mr. Carlo's husband. She was. So you say. And let us say that Mr. Carlo believed it. I did. Now, just a moment. And may I continue, Your Honor? This is highly informal, Mr. Mason. No, no, let him go ahead, Your Honor. 
I, I think I know where he's going. I was going to say that perhaps on one point, Mr. Carlo has told the truth. What do you... Yes, I say, they're approaching, Mr. Carlo. Yes. I'm saying perhaps she did love her husband. I worshipped him. So, if Mr. Carlo loved her husband, who was to say she didn't kill him? Her own husband? Motive? Jealousy. It has happened. Oh, but Mason. Mr. Carlo had a motive. And opportunity. That makes her a suspect. Well, now, Mason. Well, now, if that's all. Well, that's plenty. I'm sure the jury will remember it while uh, hearing her testimony. Uh, what if I were to prove she didn't have opportunity, Mr. Mason? Not then, eh? Would you stipulate she's to have full latitude and credibility if I prove she couldn't have killed her husband? If you will stipulate that she is a prime suspect that you can't so prove. Very well. Your Honor, at this time I wish to interpolate the testimony of certain witnesses. Witnesses? Mr. Mason has cast a shadow of suspicion on this witness. This important state's witness. Uh, I want to clear it away. Oh, but Your Honor, I didn't. <coughs> Motion granted. You started this, Mr. Mason. Oh, very well, sir. Oh, so he fell for it. Yeah, he couldn't fall fast enough. That's because he thinks he's trapping you. Mm -hmm. You want to give me that report on them, Bella? Here you are. I hate to think where we'd be without this report, Chief. Yes, up a creek. Yes, Kitty would be clear, and the jury would believe everything she said. What? Hmm? What's the matter with Mr. Ash? I don't know. Why is he charging over here? All right, Mason, all right. What's the matter with you? What have you done with Richard Lappin and Mona Lee Parks? Well, well, well. Done with them. They can't be found. Those witnesses can't be found. What? They're gone. And you know where. You'll pay for this, Mason. This time you've gone too far. Well, Prosecutor Apt doesn't know it. But the disappearance of those witnesses is an even greater blow to Perry Mason than to him. But even Perry Mason doesn't know just how serious the consequences will be. Join us on Monday, won't you? It's immediately after the close of our last episode. As you know, there's been a sensational development in the trial of State versus May Grant for the murder of Marcel Blanc. As you know, two key state witnesses have disappeared. On hearing the news, Prosecutor Apt rushed over to the defense table, accused Perry Mason of being responsible for their disappearance, and... Well, Mason? Well, do you have anything to say? I say lower your voice, Mr. Apt. Judge Selby... He's going to hear me, Mason, as will everyone in this courtroom, as will the Bar Association. Mr. Apt, Mr. Mason? Uh, just a moment, Your Honor, just one short moment, if you please. All right now, Mason... I'll give you one chance to tell me what you did with him. I hate to spoil your fun, Apt, but I'm as surprised as you are. In fact... Mason, are you going to deny that you knew... Of course I knew about them. As a matter of fact, I knew more about both of those witnesses than you did. I wanted them to testify. What? They're crooks, Mr. Apt. Show the prosecutor that insurance report this week. Yes, Mason. What? What did you say? Crooks? Insurance report. Your witnesses are crooks. They're wanted for bringing false suit against a Minnesota doctor... Show it to us. Here you are, Mr. Rapp. Go on, go on, take it. Yeah. Mm. Names are different. I think you will notice a resemblance in the photographs. And the fingerprints, Mr. Rapp. Don't forget the fingerprints. The names don't matter. A rose by any other name, you know. Well, I must say, Mason, I... Well, I must say. Looks as if I owe you a debt of thanks. Yes, it looks as though I do. Well, you can skip the debt. But if I were you, I'd go tell Judge Selby and then get on with this. Well, of course I will. Of course I will. Yes, indeed, I do owe you a debt of thanks. Well, if I had put them on the stand, I'd... Well, as it is, no harm's been done. Except that Mr. Carlo doesn't have an alibi. Hmm. Whatever makes you say that, Miss Street? Why ever wouldn't I say it? She's got no alibi. Her witnesses are gone. Therefore, as you stipulated, Mr. Rapp, she is the prime suspect. Oh, but you're wrong, Mr. Mason. Very wrong. How? Mr. Carlo has an alibi. You don't think she had only one string to her bow? What? Oh, my, didn't you know about him? You mean you didn't know about Mr. Cadrades? Another witness? That's right, Miss Street, another witness. An irreputable witness. Well, if you'll excuse me, I'll go explain to Judge Selby. How? Well, first, of course, about the two witnesses who disappeared. Yes, I think I'll uh, have him issue a bench warrant for them. 
Then I should explain that it's simply impossible for Mr. Cadrades to appear before this afternoon. So we'd best adjourn for lunch. Uh, what did you ask, Mr. Mason? I asked how. How can you explain away a lying witness? You mean Mr. Cadrades? Mr. Apt. If Cadrades alibis Kitty to Carlo, he'll have to lie. So you think, Mr. Mason. I know it as well as I know my own name. Well, then, Mason, I'm certainly happy you aren't on the jury. No, oh, very happy. Now, if you'll excuse me, please. Oh, and, uh, uh, Mr. Mason. Thanks again. I mean it. Meanwhile, in an old apartment building, many blocks away, the witness, Valeria Gedrady, slowly climbs the stairs to the fifth floor. Mama! I heard you on the stairs, Papa, so I opened the door for you. What were you doing near the door? Something happened. Our daughter? Sleeping. That is sleeping now. The doctor... Doctor? I had to get him. Oh, Papa, you should have seen her. I was so frightened. But the doctor gave her an injection. Oh. What happened? She tried to walk again this morning. Oh. I didn't know until I heard her fall. Is she... When she fell, did she hurt herself? No. The doctor does not think she harmed herself. But the pain, what, a, what about... The old injury. He said something else. Yes? Papa, she has to have... She has to have... She has to have the operation, not just for the pain, not just so she can walk. Huh? He used words I would not understand, not even in our native tongue. Shh. No one here is now a Still, you must not mention... Tell me about the doctor. She must have the operation soon, Papa. But there may not be time. She will have her operation. What? She will be well. Our girl is going to have the same chance as other girls. But the money, Papa. We will have the money. And our daughter will have her operation. Soon, Papa. Within the month. How? You must ask me no questions. But, Papa. No question, no. Papa. If I speak harshly, if I seem not to be myself... I will try to understand as I have understood before. After all, I am your wife. The wife of Gidratis, if that is a name we must use. Don't say that. Gidratis or any other name. Papa, Papa, can't you understand? This is the United States. We can talk as we wish. We can say what we wish. No one hears us in our own apartment. Oh. And don't you forget that. So, so now you are hungry. You sit down and I will make lunch and we will talk. No. No, there is nothing to say. Only that she will have the operation. And that you must never mention. Never say a word about it until Talk I... to talk is nothing if she is going to be well. That is all I care for. I too. Now I must prepare to go. And you must eat first. No, no, I'm not hungry. Papa, to bear witness will be hard. I can't eat. Then coffee. I will heat your coffee. Please, please. And you will drink coffee, Gadretti, so you will not go to court. You will not be witness at any trial. You hear me? Yes, Mama. Sorry, you have to go to court. I'm happy with what you just told me. I'm so happy. It is a big thing to be told all at once. Yes. A big thing. Papa, you're not happy. No questions. All right, no questions. Sit down here, no questions, could we? It is not a joke, Mom. Oh, it is not a joke. My man brings the most wonderful news I've heard since we entered this country. And I must not be gay. It is to laugh and joke and sing. No questions, Mama, please. All right. No questions. But why, Papa? The news you brought is what we've longed and dreamed for. And yet you're sad. I can't explain this sadness. After the trial, perhaps. Oh, yes, the trial, Papa, I understand. Oh, your clumsy wife. Of course you are sad. It is what you have to do that bears so heavy on you. It is all right. Uh, I wish you did not have to bear the witness. I must. To speak the truth is sometimes hard. It's a sad burden to carry. Mama, please. By the papers, what you say will prove the guilt of Mrs. Grant. Mama. I do not carry the burden alone. There are others who can... No. Care. Huh? You do not know. No? 
it is best that you should. I'll pour your coffee then. No, what, Mom? Wait. Mrs. Kaczynski told me a few minutes ago. Drink your coffee. Mrs. Kaczynski, what about it? Eat, Papa. And uh, here's sugar for your coffee. Mrs. Kaczynski heard it on her wireless. The others have gone away. Who? Eat Kadratis. The other witnesses who saw Mr. Carlo. They cannot be found. So it is all our new papa. Poor man. And poor lady. What? Poor Mrs. Grant, she will have to die. Stop. I will say poor lady. Even if she is guilty, she is a poor lady. So sad and so sweet looking in her picture. It is not for us to question. To question, no. To pity, yes. And the little girl. We have a little girl. What? what? We have a little girl. Pity her. Larry. I have pity and thoughts for my little girl alone. I cannot eat. I must go. And do not speak of the other again. As you wish. Do not speak. Never speak. Do not say those names again. His wife can guess. Because not only the operation, but the very lives of his beloved wife and daughter depend on Gedrady's following Anna B. Hurley's orders. Yes, Valeria Gedrady's knows well that in order to preserve his own family, he'll have to doom May Grant. Join us tomorrow, won't you? It's afternoon, two hours after the close of our last episode. Almost time for the trial of State versus May Grant for the murder of Marcel Blanc to resume. As you know, an important point may be settled in a few moments. That point, you remember, is whether or not Kitty DiCarlo, State's witness and wife of the murdered man, is herself above suspicion. Barry Mason contends she is not. That it is entirely possible Kitty DiCarlo committed the murder and now is trying to throw suspicion on Mason's client. And, of course, the only way the state can prove Mason's contention wrong is to provide Mr. DiCarlo with an adequate alibi. And that's just what the state is going to try and do. Well, right now, as we follow Perry Mason from the corridor phone booth and into Judge Selby's courtroom... Uh, excuse me. Excuse me, please. Will you pardon me, please? Uh, oh, you're back. Yes. Well, you look very cheerful, Counselor. Well, I'm wearing a big smile, am I not? Which looks as if it was tattooed on. Bad news from Paul? Well, it wasn't the best, Della. We've had bad news before. The next witness is a good man. Well, so what? Really? Paul checked him as well as he could on such short notice, but... Gadrates is a good man. A good, honest man. So say his neighbors, so say the people with whom he trades, so say his priest. Yet he's going to furnish Kitty to call her with an alibi? He's the next witness. You think it's a mistake, Perry? We'll find out when he gets on the stand. If it isn't a mistake, he'll be lying. Well, I'll give you a hundred to one on that, Bella. And if he's lying, well, any lie can be broken. At least that's what a lawyer of my acquaintance always says. A lawyer named Perry Mason. Does he? Well, now I'm going to tell you something else he says. Who? Perry Mason. What does he say? He says he's glad he has a secretary named Della Street. <laughs> glad enough to give her a raise in salary. Oh, we'll come to order. All right, all right. I didn't hear you answer, Counselor. Oh, I didn't hear what you said. Oh, great. Playing deaf at a time like this. All right, you want me to repeat? No, not now, please. I have to concentrate on the witness. I'll record your name, please. Gedredis. Valeria Gedredis. Are you a native of this country, Mr. Gedredis? No, sir. I am not. A naturalized citizen? 
I had taken out the papers, the uh, first paper. But you understand English. Oh, yes, sir. I have English, a little Polish, a little Dutch, and Czech. Much Czech and much German. So all we're interested in is your understanding of English. To write, not so well. But to hear and understand and say, yes. Very good. Now, what's your occupation, please? I, I work in the establishment of a countryman, Prusmike. And what business is that? A small grocery, sir. Your duties? Duties, I, I don't know. Uh, what do you do? Do you have an interest in the business? Are you, are you a uh, part owner? Owner? Oh, no, no, no. Prusmike is owner. I work for owner. In other words, you're a grocery clerk. Uh, now, Gadrades, do you understand that this is a most grave and serious trial? I understand. That we want only the truth. You understand that? I understand. So, Gadrades, I ask you if you know any of the principles in this trial personally. Principal? Uh, the uh, main people concerned. For instance, the defendant, that woman over there. Have you ever seen her before? No, sir. But the other lady... Uh, we'll come to her in just a moment. And to be certain you have no personal likes to grind, do you have any relatives or close friends working for the state in my office, for instance? No. No kindred. Just my wife and, and my daughter. Your daughter? Uh, does she work? Oh, no. No, my daughter cannot work. She is barely more than a child, and, and she is ill. Oh. She is a... She is lame. So you don't know any of these people? You have no personal interest in the outcome? I... Uh, no. No interest. Good. Now, Mr. Cadrades, now, is there anyone in this courtroom whom you have seen before? Yes, sir. That lady over there. Yeah. That lady? The, uh, the one I'm standing beside? Yes, sir. Stand up, Mr. Carlo. Are you are certain, Mr. Cadredes? Certain you've seen this lady? Yes, sir. Sit down, Mr. Carlo. The lady's name is Miss Catherine de Carlo. Now, tell us where you saw her, Mr. Cadredes. It was the night my daughter became ill. Go on. My daughter is lame from an accident. She She's in pain. Well, at one time, the pain is worse than at other times. When it is bad, very bad, she needs medicine. Of course, yes. Yeah. Uh, this night, it was bad. Very bad. I woke to hear her crying. She needed medicines, so I phoned Galete, the pharmacy. Uh, who? Senor Galete, who has the pharmacy. Senor Galete dispenses the medicines to me, yes. Uh, a kind man, Galete. He lets me pay when I can. Sometimes there is little money. Uh, yes, yes. Now, just just tell us what happened. Well, I, I went downstairs and called Senor Galete. The telephone was in the downstairs. At his drugstore? No, no. It, it, it was late. The Senor Galete is a kind man. And he said he would leave his home and, and meet me. Oh. I, I walked to the store and waited for him. Waited? I live closer to the pharmacy than does Senor Galete. I wait. Uh, tell us, Mr. Cadredes, did you notice the time? I did. My daughter was crying, Mr. Haft. She needed medicines. You have a watch? No. No watch by me. But there was a big clock in the window. I watched the time. And as you waited, what happened? A lady spoke to me. That lady. Uh, uh, Mr. Carlo? It was she. And now, wait, Mr. Cadredes. It was late at night. Your daughter was in pain, needing medicines. Why did you happen to notice Mr. Carlo? At first, I did not. But? The lady stopped. She was very kind. We spoke to you? The lady asked if I needed help. The kind lady. Yeah. You saw her plainly? Well, there was light. Senor Galetti keeps his windows lighted through the night. I recognized her. Recognized her? But you said you didn't know her. Oh, not, not, not to speak to, not in person. But at the cinema, the, the pictures, moving. Oh, you, you've seen her in the movies. My daughter's confined at home. When there is extra money, I wheel her to the cinema. It is a moving chair. Yes, yes, a, a wheelchair. Y yes. So you recognized Mr. Carlo? I did. And she spoke to you? For a moment. Uh, long enough for you to know her? Yes, sir. And, and you're sure of the time? You were watching the time? Yes, sir. Mr. Cadrades, 
A man known as Marcel Blanc was shot and killed in the early morning of October 29th last year. On what day did you see Mr. Carlo? On the early morning of October 29th. Mr. Gedraders, Marcel Blanc was shot at five minutes before 3 a.m. on October 29th. At what time did you see Mr. Carlo? Just before 3 o'clock. Perhaps five, perhaps three minutes before. What is the address of Galetta's Pharmacy? The corner of Hill and Patterson Streets. The corner of Hill and Patterson. Ladies and gentlemen, that corner of Hill and Patterson Streets is four miles. Four miles away from the apartment where Marcel Blanc was killed. Now, you've heard this man, this simple, good man, whose only concern is his job and his crippled daughter, this man who wants only to do his duty. You've heard this good man positively, beyond the shadow of any doubt, place Kitty DiCarlo four miles away at the time of her husband's murder. And so who does that leave, ladies and gentlemen? Who does that leave, now that Mr. Cadretes has given the lie to Mr. Mason's slanderous, desperate accusation of Mr. Carlo. You know who it leaves, ladies and gentlemen. It leaves May Grant. May Grant and May Grant alone who could have and who did murder Marcel Blanc. Your witness, Mr. Mason. Well, Perry Mason knows that Valeria Gedrades is lying. And Perry Mason also knows that May Grant faces disaster unless he can break Gedrades. But how? How to do that? Won't you join us tomorrow? Made just given by the man in the witness chair, Valeria Gedrades. It's crystal clear to everyone in the courtroom that the slow, awkward voice of the witness Gedrades was the voice of May Grant's doom. The voice of Perry Mason's defeat, unless... unless Perry Mason can prove he lied. Now, at the defense table, Perry Mason feels the pressure of the waiting tension upon him. The witness is waiting, Mr. Mason. In a moment, Your Honor, as soon as I get my notes together... Hmm. Well, Della. It'll be a tough nut to crack, Chief. Well, you can say that again. Only tough. Well, let's give it a try. I'm ready now, Your Honor. Order in court. All right, Mr. Mason. Thank you. Mr. Gedrates. Yes, sir. Hmm? Uh, yes, Mr. Mason. Now, let us understand each other from the beginning. Don't be frightened. There's nothing to be frightened about, Gedrates. There's no reason for fear. None at all. Not yet. Your Honor. Yes, Mr. Epps? I know what the defense is up to. I know his methods. Just what is your objection, Mr. Epps? I remind the court that Mr. Gedrates is foreign-born, that he isn't too familiar with our language and therefore prone to understandable errors in syntax and construction. I'm here to see that his interests are protected, Mr. Epps. Thank you, Your Honor. Go ahead, Mr. Mason. Mr. Gedrades, you have told us you saw Mr. Carlo four miles from the place where her husband was killed. Yes. At three in the morning at just about the time he was killed. Yes. You were certain of the time and the place and the date because you had a particular reason to remember. My daughter was sick. And you went to the drugstore for medicine. Yes. You called the druggist to meet you. Senor Galetta. You had done this before? Yes. Called him late at night in an emergency? Yes. You called Senor Galetta from your apartment? From the downstairs where the telephone is. What is his phone number? Senor Galetta, Quaker 7630. At what time? At about 15 minutes before 3. You then walked to the pharmacy? Yes. How far? About two blocks. On which side of the street did you walk? The south side. What is the address of the pharmacy? Corner of Hill and Patterson Street. Well, which corner? The corner east north. Northeast? Y yes. You had to cross to it? Yes. Uh, what time was this? Then, oh, about uh, five minutes before three. 
Which way did you cross the intersection? Across two streets or... No, no. How, how do you say sideways? Diagonally? Catacornered? Uh, yes. Diagonally. You waited at the pharmacy? Yes. Watching the clock in the window? Yes. My, my... From which direction did Mr. Carlo approach you? Uh... From which direction did she approach you? I think uh, from from the east. Are you sure of that? Yes, I. How was she dressed? Dressed? I. What did she say to you? She. I, I do not remember. I. She merely spoke. What time was this? She said, uh, "Oh, um, almost three o'clock." And how was she dressed? I. Uh, her coat. You say uh, she approached you from the west. She was wearing a coat. I believe a dark coat. Oh, uh, from the... Yes, yes, I believe. Objection, Your Honor. The witness has told a clear-cut, straightforward story. Up to a point. If necessary, I'll have Senor Galeta to verify I don't doubt Gadredis went to the pharmacy at the time he claims he did, and you can withdraw your objection, Mr. Rapp. I found out what I wanted to know. I found out why Mr. Gadredis is confused. Confused? His words are clear and plain. Oh, we understand what he said. But I don't believe he understands. Sit down, Mr. Rapp. Well, Mr. Mason? I say this man does not understand. I do not understand? I don't think you could. And still do what you're doing. Have you ever been to prison, Mr. Gedratis? No, I have not. Ever been arrested? No, I have not. Or sued for civil or criminal damages? Never. Mm -hmm. I suppose you're not in debt. Debt? At times there is a delay, but yes, Gedratis pays his due. You are a member of a church, Mr. Gedratis? The church? Yes, oh yes. And your wife and daughter, you love them? Yes, above all else, I love them. Therefore, the man Gedratis is a good man? Good? I may be, Mr. Mason. I believe it. Uh -huh. That's why I don't believe you could say what you've said if you had full understanding. A good man doesn't lie, as you know. Yes, I know. And it is not a question of language. You understand the words. You, you understand Polish. A little. And Dutch. And German. Much German. Yes. And Czech. Much Czech. And English. And in all those languages, in Polish, Czech, German, Dutch, here in our English, in any language... A liar is an evil man. Gedratis? Yes. An evil man. But there are degrees of evil. Degrees? Oh, yes. Do you know many words for death, Mr. Gedratis? Death? Yes. Many words. And a lie in any language causing death in any language, is the most evil of lies. Yes, that is clear, very clear. Your testimony could cause the death of an innocent woman. That woman sitting right in front of you. Now, raise your eyes and look at her, Mr. Gedratis. I see her. Without looking, I see her. Mr. Gedratis, just as there are degrees and kinds of evil, there are degrees and kinds of punishment. Mr. Gedratis... Yes, I understand. Some liars are punished by human justice. But there is other punishment. Your Honor. Yes, Mr. Mason. The prosecutor made a point of Mr. Gedrady's foreign birth and possible misunderstanding of the language. So that there can be no possible doubt. Will you please have the oath administered once again? Oh, but, Your Honor, Mr. Gedrady's has already taken the oath. Mr. Apt raised the question, Your Honor, and in so grave a matter... It can't do any harm. Very well. Uh, bailiff, give me the Bible. <clears throat> Mr. Gedratis. Yes, Excellency. Stand up in the witness box. Yes, Excellency. And place your right hand on the Bible, Mr. Gedratis. Uh, Mr. Gedratis, didn't you hear? Uh, yeah, that's right. Put your hand on the Bible. And now repeat after me. I swear to tell the truth. I swear to tell the truth. The whole truth and nothing but the truth. The whole truth and nothing but the truth. 
Holding no mental reservations or conditions. Holding no mental reservations or conditions. Or conditions. So help me God. So help me God. Remove your hand. You may sit down. All right, Mr. Mason. Thank you, Your Honor. Now, Mr. Kittredi, you have sworn on solemn oath to tell the truth, so help you God. You've also said that Kittredi's pays is due. You know what punishment you must pay if you do not tell the truth, and God abandons you. Well, Mr. Kittredi, there is a hell on earth, Mr. Mason. What? We can't hear you. I know what will happen. Then I ask you, in truth, did you see Mr. Carlo, as you have just testified, as you believe in God, as you have hope for your soul? In truth, Mr. Gadrades? Yes. I did see Mr. Carlo, as I said. In truth, I saw her. Valeria Gedredes has dared the wrath of the God he fears to shield his family from the terrible hand of Anna B. Hurley. And in so doing... It appears Gedredes has doomed May Grant unless... But by all means, join us tomorrow. It's late afternoon, several hours after the close of our last episode. And in the gathering darkness, outside an old apartment building where the Gedredes family lives... There he is. Where? In the doorway. Hi, Barry. Beautiful. Hello, Paul. Hello. Hello, clear ahead. Gadrady's is home and alone. Alone? Uh, his daughter's there, too, but she's sick. Mrs. Gadrady's won't be back for a while. Where did she go? A uh, new baby coming at the neighbor's. Oh, and Mrs. Gadrady's? Uh-huh. Beats me. Somebody gets sick, they call Mrs. Gadrady. Somebody gets in trouble, they talk to the old man. You got my reports? No, not just yours. We've been up to here in reports and notes and transcripts of testimony. Did you find anything, Perry? No, just what we've always known. If Gadrady's testimony isn't broken... May Grant will probably be convicted. Uh, I was hoping by now I'd have something he uses as a lever. Well, I can't wait any longer. Oh, we've given it a try, Perry. We'll keep trying, but so far all we get is the information Gadrades is a good man. Yes, that's why I'm here. Because maybe he is a good man, Chief? In spite of yeah, what? Yeah. Maybe an appeal to his conscience will work. Well, something's got him. I'll be here when oh, you come. Oh, wait a minute, Paul. Uh, did you get what I asked you to? Yeah, but I don't know why you want a twenty-five caliber automatic. Well, I hope you don't have to find out. All right, Della, let's go. Five A, Perry. Mm-hmm. I'll knock. Oh, the door's open. Mm-hmm. And no light on inside. Well, Paul just said he was here. Yeah. Well. See anybody? Uh, look through the door to the kitchen there, in front of the uh, kitchen window. Huh? Oh yes, Mister Padres. Just sitting there at the table. Come on. He doesn't hear us. Wait. Mr. Gadrades. Who? Hello, Mr. Gadrades. Oh. You remember us? Yes. I ask your pardon for not rising, Miss Street. That's all right. I am tired. Very tired. But please sit down. Thank you. You're not surprised to see us? No. The door was open. Then you expected us. Well, I thought perhaps. You know why I'm here? I know. Today you may have taken a life, Mr. Gadrates. You can give it back tomorrow. I am God, Mr. Mason, to give life. You played God today. When you took May Grant's life. That's why I'm here. 
as you know. You expected me? Yes. I won't say what you want me to say, Mr. Cadretes. Huh? We're not going to argue. There is no reason to argue. You know what you did. The lies you told me may grant conviction and death. Death for an innocent woman. No. So, actually, from a moral point of view, you committed murder. No. There's no other way to look at it. There's no other way your God will look at it. No, I'm not going to argue with you. You know all the arguments as well as I do. We think you've been going over these arguments, Mr. Cadrades. Yes. Over and over and over. Because you know what's on your conscience. The life of an innocent woman never harmed you or yours. That's why I came to see you. Not only to ask for Meg Grant's life, but to give you warning. Warning? I don't know what secret pressure made you lie as you did. Nothing, no pressure, Don't tell me that. We're not in court now. There is no judge, no jury, no one to listen, no one to impress. Just us. And now I'm telling you what I know. I know there was pressure on you. You had a reason for lying. No. You lied and you know it. And we know it. You're hiding the reason for your lie, and I know that also. Mr. Cadrady's I will find that reason. Whatever it is, I will find it. It will take time, but I have got time. I'll take it. May Grant doesn't have time. Tomorrow is coming too fast for that innocent young woman, Mr. Cadrady's. So listen well. I'm going after you. I'll find what you've got hidden, and when I do, you won't have gained a thing. You'd better face it now, Mr. Gadrades, because sooner or later... No, sooner or later you will have to. But later will be infinitely worse. Because May Grant will be dead. Beyond help. Mr. Mace. Yes? You... You believe I lie. I know it. But I'm a good man. Mr. Mason, to lie. Such, such a terrible lie. Oh, there must have been a reason, Mr. Cadrades. We understand that. A very compelling reason. I'm offering not only a warning and a threat, but help, Mr. Cadrades. You need help. I'm here to give it. Mr. Mason, for a good man to lie, such an evil lie. There would have to be a reason. A big one. If there was such a reason, it would have to be such that... that it, would, it would have to be so that there could be no help. How do you know there could be no help? Unless you tell me. I have nothing to tell. I was just trying to show Mr. you... Mr. Gadrades, Mr. Gadrades. Do you believe that I will track down and expose the hidden motive for what you did? I had no all such right, motive. All right, all right, Then let us say if you had. Don't you think that I can find it in time? You would try. I believe you would try. Perhaps even find it out. Then why squander May Grant's life to gain nothing? Bella, suppose you wait out in the hall. Mr. Cadrades will talk more freely without a witness. Oh, yes, of course. It will do no good. I assure you, it will do no good. You go anyway, Bella. All right. Papa. Oh, my daughter, she's awake. Oh, pardon. I, I must see her. Pardon, please. Adele. Papa. Oh, Perry, I think he was about to talk. Maybe. But you're supposed to rest. Oh, Papa, I'm well enough to meet them. The pain is almost stopped. Please. Oh, all right. Mr. Mason. Yes? Would you step into my daughter's room? My daughter would like to meet you. Yes, of course. Come on, Ella. This is Mr. Mason, Adele, and Miss Street. Mr. Mason is a lawyer, and Miss Street is his secretary. Hello, Adele. Hello. Mr. Mason. Mystery. As you see, my daughter is ill. Oh, not really ill, Papa. Not very. I mean, well, I'm lame. I, I did something I'd been told not to do and, and hurt myself. As Papa says, I punished myself. Shh, daughter, please. I tried to walk again. I heard if you have enough faith, you can do anything, even walk when you are lame. Shh, darling, please. When I tried, I fell down. And... But there will be other days. Yes, yes, there will be other days. Better days, days when you will walk. That's what I said, Papa. Days when... My daughter is tired. 
You best go. We haven't talked, Papa. There's no, no reason for you to talk. Mr. Mason, Miss Street. But, Papa. As for you, you close your eyes and rest. You afraid to talk about anything, Mr. Cadradis? Even with that girl in there, your daughter? She can't trap you. I didn't want her disturbed. She is not the one who was disturbed. She is not the one who is punishing herself. Last chance, Mr. Cadradis, and then I'm through talking. You will have forced me into action. I'm sorry because I know that you're carrying a heavy load, but you leave me no alternative. You stand by what you've done, and you shall have to take the consequences. Well? Come on, Donald. All right, Chief. Oh, Mr. Cadradis, tell your daughter we were pleased to meet her. Tell her she's a nice girl. And you might tell her... Those who fall when they're asked not to walk... aren't the only ones who receive punishment. Well, there's no doubt about it. Gedrady's refusal to repair the damage his testimony did to May Grant is forcing Perry Mason to take action. But in just what direction that action will take, well, won't you join us tomorrow 